Phase 1 of the Twilight Cinematic Universe was more of an experiment. I was just testing the grounds and honestly it just started as me being bored. However, after gaining a lot of traction, mainly due to the success of Bent and Omnitech, I knew that I had to continue. And so I did. Phase 2 represents a big expansion of the universe and of my ideas and it's one of the most exciting things I've ever done. So let's break it down and show you some behind the scenes details. Phase 2 started with the spectacular Spider-Man Craven's Last Hunt, which is a direct continuation of the Sentinels one, the first Sentinels, in which uh, Peter was uh, introduced. This is the first movie to have this sort of title sequence and I've tried to do it with most of the Spider-Man movies, I've only made two of them, uh, because it reminds me of the Sam Raimi movies, you know, they had the whole web images thing, you remember. Of course, based on the original story, written by Jim DeMatteis, or DeMatteis, I don't really know. Uh, the theme song that you're hearing is actually written and played by me on my guitar. That's pretty much the ceiling of my skill on the guitar. I don't expect me to be the next Van Halen anytime soon. I am the one playing Craven here, uh, doing my best attempt at a Russian accent, which you would think is, uh, is easy for me, as I live pretty much in that Eastern European area, but I I don't know, it it doesn't sound that Russian to me. And I mean, who knows, Craven has been in America for quite some time now, maybe he's uh, adapted. This is an attempt at the dream sequence, and uh, apart from it looking like a fever dream, I don't think uh, I don't think it uh, works that well. But yeah, uh, Craven was a figure made from scratch uh, using a uh, wire armature and uh, and tin foil wrapped in uh, paper tape or masking tape, and it doesn't look okay except for this for part here. And worst of all, it wasn't that well articulated, and it didn't stand. Uh, he didn't stand on his own feet. I, was a, I always had to support him with either a wire or a stand or my hands or anything. So I'm glad I didn't have to use this figure again. At this time I was still using the 5 frames per second frame rate, which of course looks kind of funky. But later I changed to what is about 10 frames per second, which is much better. That's an attempt at um, at a coffin, and um, I don't. It doesn't really look like a coffin, does it? It's just a cardboard box with some uh, napkins in it. It looks comfy, but not really like a comfy coffin. This monologue at the start is pretty much uh, one uh, uh, word for word the monologue from the comic. I retooled it a little bit to make it fit the movie. But uh, yeah, this is very much inspired by it, with some big differences that are going to be noticeable soon. This movie starts with, uh, I mean, the second part of the movie starts with the funeral of Vector, who was dead at the time, after Shantai season 1. Okay, There's MJ, uh, MJ, and one of the last time that uh, Dumb Baby Energy voices anyone in this universe. Uh, she's unfortunately not... Uh, a part of the Epic Film Studios team anymore due to some personal issues, but um, yeah, it's okay. We moved on, and that oh, is uh, the yeah, second time way. and the last time that I'm using that uh, Spider-Man figure for Spidey. As you know, the an old uh, Spectacular Spider-Man figure, it had a weird gadget thing that I cut off and sculpted over. It's not the best, but it gets the job done for now. Luckily, I changed the figure later. And here's Peter sleeping. Of course, uh, one big difference from the comic, Spidey isn't wearing his black suit. In the comic he was wearing the black suit, but not the symbiote one, the cloth one uh, that he wore after he took off the symbiote. Uh, but here he wears a classic red and blue, because I feel it's more normal than just a cloth black and white, uh, black suit. And also he just got out of the Venom symbiote after he was controlled by it. Uh, so it doesn't really make sense to give him the black suit after he just got rid of it. It's not uh, not that big of a deal. I think actually this is what they should have done in the in the comic. But you know the black suit also fits in with the dark tone of the comic, so it's all good. And this is my attempt at the swinging scene. As you can see, lighting uh, lighting 
was not the best because the only light came from the, my monitor which was behind this blue paper that I used as the sky and of course this figure is not very articulated so it didn't make for the best uh, sw swing poses uh, fortunately this uh, changes in the second Spider-Man movie and this is the longest I think that Spider-Man talks to himself in any of my movies uh, that's supposed to be a wall but it's just um, the cardboard cover from a chocolate a banana chocolate as you can see that right there it's barely noticeable it lasts for less than half a second there's a black dot there that's supposed to be a gunshot a gun hole a shot hole a, a hole from a gunshot just a, a little detail that I put in there you know I like to highlight those things and that is the train the train background from Shantai season 1 episode 1 if you remember and as you can see there well you can't really see now but um, he has the stand to hold him up and that spear is just uh, a kitchen stick I don't know how you call those in English but you know, you stab meat with them and eat it. Oh, he gets stabbed I get and talks to himself it. again. Oh, one thing I forgot to notice, uh, to, to specify. In this movie, I am voicing Spider-Man. Um, it was supposed to be Jeb, uh, once again, reprising his role, but unfortunately he had some family problems and he couldn't do it in time. Uh, so I took over for this one movie and this alone. So... Yeah, you're just going to have to deal with my voice as Spider-Man for this one. And that in his hands uh, is supposed to be a rifle. I don't, ha I didn't have guns, gun accessories back then. I do now. So that is just a UV pen. You know, those things you used to copy in tests to cheat. And here we have the grave. I don't really know where I got the inspiration for it. You know, uh, a spider, because that... That, puts, that gets put on crosses. Here lies Spider-Man, slain by the hunter. And there is, that's where my black pen ran out. Because uh, thank you, thank you, black pen. And there you see Craven in the Spider-Man suit. A quite, quite a horrific image, I must say. And if you see these white things on his mustache and beard, this head sculpt is based around his look from... The spectacular Spider-Man, I'm going to put an image on here. And I put the white spots on there to signify, you know, white hairs in the beard. Fortunately, it's kind of difficult to do that with uh, a flat surface. So it looks uh, like yogurt or ice cream, maybe even milk. Yeah. And that's a very Red Mary Jane. I don't really know how, how she turned out so red and even the blouse is very green. I have no idea, but um, I I should have fixed it back then. I don't remember why I didn't. So yeah, this is radioactive MJ, and that is a whole nother gravestone because of course. And I'm using a small camera, a mini camera, as a TV. The same thing that I did in the Sentinels, if you remember, in Tony's lab when he was studying Bruce and uh, later on the symbiotes. That is the box from my SH figure Spider-Man that uh, I later use as the Spider-Man figure and then I later break trying to fix it uh, you can find more info on that in my uh, 2023 collection video yes and here we once again see Ash Ketchum as generic background character because um, why not <laughs> he, he, he just uh, he's just in scale with everyone, but he's not articulated, so I can really use him as a character. He's just there in the background, and this time he's a stalker. Poor Ash. <laughs> Those are some tight pants. Actual dialogue from the comic, by the way. Those are some tight pants. I I think I'm going to show it on the screen right now. That is actual dialogue from the comic. And here she starts running, and Ash uh, he can't he can't really run, so he just kind of wobbles over faster. <laughs> and now not Spider-Man comes and punishes him and Spider-Man, I mean not Spider-Man, walks away because guess what? He's not Spider-Man. And that's the lizard. And I cut it just one frame too late, but uh, YouTube is very weird with the skipping. So um, yeah, that's a dinosaur figure and I think I used it in Bent and Omnitech when he was on Plantapia with a wet wipe that 
you know, I dried out and ripped apart to make a lab coat. And I think it works, except for the fact that it's too short. The lizard is too short. It would be perfect for a three and a quarter, three and three quarter inch scale, but it does not fit with six inch because he's actually shorter than uh, the figures. As you can see, Spider-Man has to crouch to even be at almost the same height. I'm not going to like the, the animation here in fight scenes is pretty, pretty whack. And once again, Craven in the Spidey suit. But here we get Spidey escaping from his grave. In the comic, it was a big giant moment. Uh, featuring uh, introspection of Peter with uh, a lot of Im imagery, but that was kind of hard to do for me back then, so we just skip straight to Peter escaping. Those are biscuit crumbs, because, you know, I couldn't bring dirt into the house. And he also wobbles away instead of walking, because those Toy Biz ball joints, actually, I think this was Hasbro, 2008-2009, uh, but they still were using those horrible ball joints, and he, I, I can't get my head around them. I don't get how to articulate them. He just ends up falling. He barely stands up when he's vanilla pose. So yeah, uh, luckily I moved away from that figure, and I'm glad I did. There he finds a newspaper, and uh, yeah, that's a newspaper that I made uh, especially and exclusively for this movie. Spider-Man, the murder, of course, from the Daily Bugle. Bugle? B Bugle. He jumps on the window. And now we see that Craven has been waiting for this. Yeah. He's squalming, uh, in my bad Russian accent. And now Spider returns with the most suave and romantic song there. Because I just had to, you know. I think the only song less fitting right there. The only song worse that still fits the idea would have been actually Careless Whisper. But I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and of course Peter has uh, PTSD from being buried alive. I think that's pretty understandable. And uh, there's the actual Spectacular Spider-Man theme song. How did I not get copyrighted for that? No idea. But I'm glad I didn't. Because I made the large sum of zero dollars <laughs> from this movie. I. I once I think I said it said it before, but I don't make these movies to make money. This is a pure passion project. And here's the final showdown. Too far. Two weeks. And you you can see Spider-Man is not actually showing two with his fingers. That is because the fingers are not articulated. Did you expect an actual reason? No, it, it's a, it's an old figure. Uh, what I would have done now is just use more sound effects in there to signify the movement and the action. But back then my sound effect library was not even a third of what it is now. And you're going to see that in future mov uh, movies while I'm doing this. So yeah, that's there's always things that I would uh, do differently at my old movies, uh, but I don't because I think it's cool for everyone to see the evolution of where I started versus uh, where I am now. I think that's important. What? And you shouldn't be ashamed of uh, your past because you've evolved. You are better now than you were yesterday and the day before and the day before and a year before and whatever. You're constantly improving and if you're doing that, you should be proud of yourself. I am so, I'm so good at giving pep talks. Wow. Hmm. And here we get the second fight with the lizard in this that's episode. And you can see nothing, because once again I forgot that, you know, light has to hit the characters, so it's mostly dark. The lizard is black. I, it's painted green, but you can't see it, you can't tell. Uh, of course, this is another thing that I would do differently, you know, like turn on the light. <laughs> I tried to simulate it being in a dark uh, basement or something, but it's too dark, you know. And he stabs the lizard, and now the lizard runs away. And now the movie is reaching its resolution, its conclusion, where yeah, where Craven promises to Spider-Man that he will never ever kill again. No, Spidey doesn't believe him because he's killed a lot of people. Uh, Craven has killed a lot of people, not not Spider-Man. Duh. Uh, but then we see why Craven won't kill other people. Of course, with an ending monologue, we start the movie with Craven and then 
uh, sorry, ended with Craven, dead in his coffin by suicide. Which is actually what happens in the comic too, and I think is a great, great character moment. And Craven was amazing in that um, comic. Unfortunately, Marvel decided to bring him back from the dead years later because it's it it's Marvel. Why why would they start uh, stick with good character development moments? Not even to mention one more day. I, I'm not touching that story with the one foot pole. Wait, one foot is not that one foot is not that long. That's what happens when a non-American tries to use American uh, sayings. It, it doesn't work out. But 12 foot pole? Yeah, th yeah, that's bigger. And uh, the end credits. Uh, it was actually just me and Dumb Baby Energy doing the voices because my brother couldn't while uh, I was producing it. I can't remember why, but I know he couldn't. And I didn't start to reach out back then to other voice actors. Uh, that's also something that I'm glad I did, because the voice actor community is great. It's honestly great, and they don't get enough credit for what they do. Weirdly enough, this movie doesn't have a post credit scene. That's something I've started doing more and more often. But now that I think of it, I don't really know what I would have put as an end credit scene. Oh well, time for Shantai Season 2. When you get out. That there, if you couldn't tell, and I wouldn't blame you for not being able to tell, was Jade asking Bubo what he would do when he gets out of prison. That's uh, me trying to set up the theme of the season. Uh, what will Bubo do when he gets out of prison and is basically absolved of his crimes? We will see. But we start with the prison. And that is the second version of the Wubu figure, made from scratch from the same, uh, using the same technique that I use for Craven, except the hands and feet are from the old one. He could stand a little bit better because the feet were actually plastic, but of course this big old head that I'm still using is heavy and you can see it was weighing the figure down and also the reds don't match. And uh, here we have Tido, that is not actually Tido because Tido was Wubu. And what was this piece is called? I don't know, a cannon bolt without the ometrix, of course, because he's not Ben 10. Just a bullying Bubo, basically. And now Bubo gets angry and beats them up. This is the title screen, more orange. I just uh, felt that this color fit the season. I don't ask me exactly why, it's just how I felt. I was getting that vibe, you know. Of course, still with the theme song from season 1. And with the brand new Vector theme. Because Vector comes back this season. Um, and I just uh, I just talk trash of Marvel for uh, reviving Kraven. And then I go ahead and do the same with Vector. But you know, Vector didn't get a character arc, really, in Shantai season 1. And he starts to get one here. His story is still not over, by the way. I'm still There's still something I want to do with him. But that's uh, way, way down the line. But we see him here, uh, beaten up, you know, ravaged, destroyed. I actually took a lighter uh, and burned some of the things on him. Some red paint uh, everywhere, some green to show that the costume is ripped. Actually made his leg look broken. Uh, there's red crayon there on my table to imitate blood. But, you know, it doesn't really look like blood. So, yeah. There's Vector, and there is Patch, and Patch is the first ever time uh, that I worked with a voice actor, an external one, not my girlfriend, my family, my friends. Uh, so Patch here is voiced by the brilliant Brian K. Scott. He plays a few more roles in my movies, but this was his debut, debut. and I love what he's doing with Patch. He he's amazing. I can't. Thank him enough for what uh, for the contributions he brings to the channel. So thank you, Brian. Uh, the thing I would change with Patch uh, is to give him a patch. You know, he just has um, this normal eye and this glass eye. I think that's what they're called. You know, the fake eye made of ceramic or whatever. I would have given him a patch, but uh, I don't know why I didn't. I actually don't know. Fun fact: this. Uh, figure is not a figure, it used to be a lighter from Egypt, out of all places. Uh, of course, 
uh, it doesn't work anymore. But it used to be a lighter, you know, you just uh, pop the head open and actually you'll see in the finale. I'm guessing you watch the movies if you're watching this, so I'm just going to spoil everything. And he drags Factor away. And back in prison, we see Bubo talking to Alan about the riot. And this is the last time that Bubo uh, is voiced by Dumb Baby Energy, because after this episode, she left the channel to do whatever she did. I don't really know. Uh, but she was still here for uh, episode 1. And her departure is basically the reason why uh, there's a big gap between episode 1 and episode 2 and the other future projects. That and also me finishing high school. You know, that also was a thing. Lucky that lawyer took our case. That lawyer that uh, Ellen mentions is the first... Uh, I wouldn't really call it an easter egg. Uh, unless you can tell, but it's not really that obvious. But it's the first reference to Matt Murdock. In this universe. For all we know, you were influenced by Kangoo. A mention of Kangoo, of course. Uh, Kangoo did influence Bubo in Shantae Season 1, but Kangoo was nowhere to be seen because, you know, his magic he just hides himself. And somehow Matt convinced uh, the judge that uh, Bubo was under influence of a magician, not drugs. Do not do drugs, kids. I swear to God, they're just no good for you. I'm, I'm not even joking here. And yeah, we also get to know that Kangu isn't registered as a citizen of Toyland, which is the country this is all happening in. Which even, uh, which adds even more to his mystery, because he's a mysterious figure. What do we know of him, apart from the fact that he's a magician in a temple next to Tora, the town? And we see Bubo taking responsibility for what he did, because he feels regret, you know, over killing Vector. It's kind of a big thing. You would feel regret too if you killed your friend. And here he gets a visit from Jade. Yeah. That was Jade. I swear to God. She is a Playmobil figure because I wanted her to be close in scale to Bubo. She's still a bit short. Um, and she is based on a Pet Petro Sapien, you know, the diamond head species, but she's a girl. And yeah, she is called Jade because of the rock Jade. The She is also voiced by Dumb Baby Energy. Dumb baby energy so. She's just having a dialogue with herself right now, which I'm sure we all have sometimes, you know, sometimes I talk to myself. And here we find out that there was a search team sent to find Vector, and they did not, because uh, of course Patch dragged him away. So this is basically Bubo's first clue that something is off, something is not right. And yeah, Vector is a radioactive lizard, that's, that's why he's got the claws, and yeah, and they kiss. Now we see Vector being worked on by Patch. That's once again the mini camera from uh, Sentinel 1 and Craven's Last Hunt. Really got a lot of views out of that. And here we see Vector in his cyborg form. He, I added metallic parts to him. He even has that glowing red eye there just to make him look more robotic. And even in the voice performance of Katush, my brother, he changed his name for Mr. Soviet Milk, which I think is a good uh, decision. He even plays him a little bit more uh, robotical, more automated, like without emotion, emotionless, yeah, that's the word. And I even it even put the robot voice modifier in him, like I do with Iron Man, with Trio, with whoever. Patch here mentions that he has some unfinished business that we later find out is related to Alan. Although I don't show it, that might, you know, might come, come out in um, in future movies. What Patch had to do with Alan, and this is Bubo back in prison, and the first appearance of Leon, voiced again by Brian K. Scott, doing a very, very different voice than the one he does for Patch. And Brian just has such great range; it's unbelievable, honestly. Once again, thanks to him for his work here. He's great. You can see there, right there, my fingers holding Leon because he's a plush toy. He's not articulated. And we get Leon's backstory. Yeah, Leon is a school shooter. There we go. That You have it, folks. And yeah, Leon has a fascination with bombs. That's his thing. Once again, there are my fingers. I, I was so bad at hiding them. Back then, I'm a bit better now, I think. And explosion. Dramatic red light. Because this is all dramatic. 
I can't, I don't even remember how I got the red light there, but I did. And that's the end of the first episode. Of course, no post credits in for individual episodes. So let's go on to episode two. This is the first and last time ever that I'm using a mini camera to shoot this because as you can see, it's in four by three and it doesn't fit the rest of the uh, scenes in the in the episode. I tried to use a camera uh, to have you know an independent device to shoot the movie, but because it it was a mini camera and it was old, it only had four by three, which uh, you can tell does not fit. But this uh, this is a one shot action scene with people you know fighting through the prison break. The only way that I can justify it being four by three is that this is a POV of a security camera. But you know, security cameras don't run along with characters, so I'm sorry, but I really didn't want to reshoot this scene again. So we are stuck with this. Another ben two Benton aliens that uh, appear in this prison. I, I guess Benton aliens just don't have any luck in Thailand. Of course, Leon um, encourages Bubo to fall into his uh, criminal personality because Leon thinks that Bubo is faking being good. That's his whole deal. And he wants Bubo to escape, he wants Bubo to kill again, he wants him to become that awful version of him. Uh, just like Leon did with himself. He became the worst version of Leon that he can be, pretty much. And here Leon escapes, never to be seen again for one season because he comes back in season 3. He saves Quirtle here and uh, this is where I picked up the voices of both Bubo and Squirtle because as I said, dump baby energy made her exit. And I still didn't have a quite clear idea of how I wanted to voice them. With Bubo I was there, I didn't change it much in uh, the future projects, but uh, for Squirtle this is pretty much uh, my voice just a bit higher, you know, it sounds like this. But then for future um, future versions I spoke even higher, you know, like this. And uh, my voice became even more uh, nasally. And uh, while I was talking like this, I also added this uh, high pitch you know, to the voice. And that's how I got the Squirtle voice. For Bubo, I'm talking like myself, just a little bit higher. You no, know, trying to channel out the kid in me. And you can tell because in those two last lines, Bubo and Squirtle sound really, really alike. But yeah, this is Squirtle enjoying being an officer. And yeah, this is Stormvolt 1, the first uh, version of Stormvolt, and it gets blown up and has to be rebuilt. Here you can see it goes back to uh, 16 by 9 which is uh, a lot better. This is Alan's home, that is supposed to be a fridge door that is opening. And you can see there a dark gold color, because it's in the dark, and the clock. You guessed it, I'm reusing backgrounds again. That used to be Anker's lair. And there's Vector, and they start to fight. Alan, once again, uh, creates a lightsaber, like he did in the first Toyland movie. Uh, you can see here the frame rate doesn't really help the action. It was still in 5 frames per second. Again. That's Alan's car, you know, the one from Toyland. But instead of a police car here, he's modified it. You can see the racing stripe. Still no headlights. He's Alan. And Vector pretty much trashes it. So Alan's going to have to get a new one. And uh, while the voice for Alan, I always had in my head, like clear what I wanted to sound like, it was only until a bit later than this that I actually started to uh, do his accent. You know, his accent, because he talks like this. Not, not exactly like this, but like this. He has that weird accent to him. It's kind of hard to replicate, but once I get in the groove, then I can do it all over, over and over. And here we see Bubo with his hat that uh, he also had in uh, Shantai Season 1, looking at the fug fugitive poster for Vector. And here is the first appearance of the Mark 48, if I'm not mistaken, of Tony's armor. Now, the head, instead of looking too small, looks too big. Uh, and he is now way taller, way taller than um, Alan, instead of being too short. So I'm st I still didn't get it right. Uh, this reaction is uh, over phase 2 apart from Toyland World on Earth because that's going to have its own behind the scenes uh, video uh, and I can tell you right now uh, that uh, I'm going to change this for that movie for Toyland World on Earth I'm going to have, I already have the figure uh, of the Iron Man suit that's just 
perfect six inch scale. And this is uh, still me doing all the voices. Apart from Vector and uh, Brian's uh, characters, I am the only one doing voices here. Which uh, is why I started to gravitate towards hiring voice actors. Because it sounds better not having one guy talk. I mean, you can't really tell the difference here between me, uh, I mean, <laughs> sorry, Tony and Alan. There you can see a digital map of Toyland. It's not actually a map of Toyland, it's just a map that I found online. I have no idea of how exactly New City is configured, but I just needed something there, you know. Retroactive tracking based on motion camera and sensor responses. Those words actually make sense if you uh, try to stay and analyze them, uh, because I stayed and analyzed them before writing them. Going to be five more years, Bubo. Yeah, just five years for escaping the prison. What a time to be alive. And that's supposed to be a warehouse. Um, I These are like uh, advertisement brochures from, uh, in this case, Magneti Marelli, which were given out at my high school. And I think because it is Magneti Marelli who work in uh, automotive parts, it works as a warehouse. And there's Vector, of course, with a better view of his cyber form. A lot of metal, this backpack, which was actually, I think, a Monopoly house or a hotel. It's red, so it's a house, right? Was helped. Somebody gave you a new chance at life. I thought you were... And that's the second part of Vector's team, you know? It's a bit more uh, punk rock, a bit more chuggy, faster, of course. And, of course, the voice transition from normal to robotic. Uh, and this is the best fight scene in the, in the show. In the season, sorry, not in the show. With more sound effects, but still, I would use a bit more now. And that was supposed to be slow motion. It doesn't look like slow motion, does it? Vector takes off his cyborg face mask. Uh, face part, face plate, it's not really a mask. And he's now fixed. And yes, Patch is a peng penguin. You know, if you can tell. If you listen closely there, he says, I know this lawyer Matt. And then he gets this, uh, the, interrupted by the big robot, the big giant robot coming in. But he was about to say Matt Murdock, that's the second reference to Matt Murdock in just in two episodes, yeah. No, I was really right. pushing for that. Vector gets stolen every day in Ohio. So let's move on to the finale of season two. It starts with Vector being tied to a table in um, Patch's lab in Patch's basement. Tied of course with masking tape because I didn't have I didn't have the patience, you know, to work on it and make it look like he's actually tied down by metals. But yeah, this is an even better look at uh, at Vector's cyborg form, you know, metallic with the V here on his stomach and this logo, it it doesn't really look like it here. It's an R inside the dotted circle. It's the same logo that you see on Alan's uh, shoulder, on his uniform. So that uh, that is the one clue as to their connection. And hey, you can see my mouse there. I'm so good at uh, hiding things in the background. I'm not. And here is Bubo on my kitchen table. <laughs> you can really see the difference between it and my desk because it's darker. Uh, and this is the best lighting in this whole season because um, I had natural lighting from outside, because there's a window in my uh, kitchen and I didn't have the curtains covering it. Um, but I, I needed the kitchen table because it was bigger and I needed space for the giant robot. And here is Bubo about to be tortured by Patch. You know, tortured. There's the big robot. It's surprisingly well articulated and it was cheap. I got it, of course, secondhand you know, in a flea market or uh, I think a store, you know, like a doll store. It was really, really cheap. And it's gigantic. It, like 12 inches. And yeah, it's a combat suit, so it was actually Patch kidnapping Vector. Of course, Patch is very narcissistic, in case you couldn't tell. And here the fight begins. He shoots after Bubo. And now Sonic makes an appearance in this final episode. He makes a cameo, as everyone likes to call them. He comes in to save Bubo and Vector. Because I'm guessing... Uh, Bubo was tracked, you know, by Alan and uh, Tony, who wanted to see what happened to Vector. And, okay? of course, uh, Sonic is working with the Sentinels. And yeah, uh, Vector mentions that uh, Patch works in the cave, and Sonic just 
scans the room like in an instant. And now patch uh, out of a temper tantrum, temper tantrum blows the whole thing up as you do. And that is the new uh, effect for Sonic's dash. You know, no longer the PNG of the gradient. This time is a PNG of blue lining inspired by the movie. And that uh, is how Patch's cave goes down. And his projects are all gone, considering there are more projects, you know, I didn't show it. And that's uh, Sonic covered in sandpaper because I didn't have, you know, actual cave residue at my uh, at my home. And there's Vector in a very orange uh, setting, standing on the robot, you know, which is now not functional. Oh, he called him a jerk. So harsh. That was me trying to have a Vector call Patch a bad word while still keeping it, uh, you know, PG-13, family-friendly, because I want to keep this family-friendly. I don't want to be an exclusivist. The only characters that are uh, exceptions to that rule are uh, Moon Knight, uh, Deadpool, and maybe Harley Quinn, but I'm not uh, certain on that. Of course, now Patch asks for mercy. He wants to continue living. He's been defeated. And the first on-screen uh, murder that actually happens, and you can see there, that uh, Patch was actually a lighter in uh, before he was an actor. Now, here we go. This is how I set up Season 3 of Shantai, which I thought uh, would take a lot longer to make than what it actually did take. This was released in, two, uh, in 2022 and Shantai Season 3 came out in 2023, so just one year. I thought this would take a lot more because I had the big plans for Season 3. And yeah, Stormvolt did blow up. I think that uh, that was a funny moment, you know? Squirtle being so enthusiastic to do exciting things as an officer and you know Alan having to calm calm me down because you can't actually you can't really just decide what to do as a police officer. You have to enforce the law that's already there. And there we set up season three where Bubo joins the Black Ops team to catch Leon. Which is exactly what season three shows. And there's uh Jade's car, you know, a beetle. I also love the Beetle. I, I think I would get on well with Jade. Everything all right? Jade is also voiced by me, doing my best female voice, which is uh, very bad. But at least I had the metallic filter on, you know, which I also used for Diamond Head. And once again, they kiss, and that's the end of the show. This also didn't have a post credit scene, even though I could swear it did have one. Oh well, up next is The Guardians. The second team-up movie, well, the third one, if you can't Toyland, the first one. Now, for uh, I if, before I, we do this and uh, Superior Spider-Man, I want to say a few things. During the production of these two movies, I was at my lowest mentally that I've been in a long, long while. And I didn't really have anyone to talk to, which also meant I didn't really have anyone helping with these movies. I pretty much only had my brother. And because this, uh, these two projects uh, were happening uh, at the same time as Shantai Season 2, uh, I didn't quite yet start talking to voice actors, which uh, led me to using AI. Uh, and I know AI and using AI instead of voice actors is a thing that is looked down on by pretty much everyone, not just the voice actor community. And I am sorry for that. I do regret it because it honestly doesn't even uh, sound that well because it's AI. And it's a thing that I should have realized sooner that is not okay. But uh, I hope I can be forgiven for that. It, uh, I definitely moved on from it and I do now work as much as I can with other voice actors, and I do encourage it. So, um, yeah, let's proceed. That's what I wanted to say before we begin. This movie, for me, I want it to be pretty much what Toyland was for the characters in Toyland, but this would be for the USA part of the universe, uh, because it introduces a lot of characters, and by that I mean two characters. Uh, Batman and Daphne as Black Widow, with Ben 10 returning and also Vector making an 
an appearance. Uh, because Ben, Batman and Daphne are in the USA, Vector is in Thailand. Thailand is a country in this universe. And here we have the Batman figure, the first and last appearance of it, the black suit. Inspired a lot by uh, Robert Pattinson's suit, at least in the concept sketches, it didn't quite turn out like that. And Robin's figure, which is a stock, like it, it's actually not modified, almost at all. Why to scare people? Or... Scare people, you know, scarecrow. Drown the city. Drown the city is a reference to the Batman movie of uh, 2022, because that happens at the end. I'm, I mean, it's it's been two years. It's not really a spoiler, but go watch the movie. It's amazing. I am the one voicing Robin, because as I said, I was alone at this moment. And I also voiced Batman, doing a deep voice. And I also had the voice modifier to make it even lower, like a low pitch modifier. Of course, in the first scene, a lot of references to other Batman villains, but here we see Blitzwolfer, or Penwolf, however you prefer. And you think, hmm, that's not right, because he's robbing a bank. That blue thing there is supposed to be... Uh, money bag. Man bat have wings. And man bat indeed does have wings. And we then see it uh, shape shift into Ghost Freak and flies away and disappears. Once again, a reference to Clayface. He doesn't fly. But he doesn't fly. And now the mystery machine. I don't have a giant mystery machine. I do want one. I had one as a kid, but it just fell apart. I want uh, like that big uh, playset with the mystery machine and the uh, mystery incorporated figures, but I don't have it so I painted it because I need a backdrop from Daphne Which is unfortunately the first victim in this movie to fall to AI as I used a pretty pretty bad text-to-speech app Cine -minis monster. The Cine Minis monster is not a thing. It's just something I invented and you can see her outfit is pretty much the Daphne outfit in black apart from these uh, wrist parts which I kept uh, purple or it's not really purple, but it's not really pink. Light purple. To show that it is indeed Daphne. I also uh, gave her a cleavage because, you know, Black Widow. And the Black Widow logo. Which is a Black Widow logo, not a Bantan logo. Or an Albedo logo. And now we also introduce Ben. Uh, once again, the Omnitrix can talk and can inform him. He gets a call from Gwen. And uh, Ben is the second victim as I used the text-to-speech that um, specifically, specifically had the voice of... who had the voice of uh, Yuri Lowenthal, because I wanted Ben to sound like uh, Ben. I didn't want to voice him again like I did in Ben the Tech, because at this point it was pretty much only me and my brother working, so it would have been really repetitive. And that's unfortunate. It uh, The same thing happened to Gwen. Once again, another lame text-to-speech side. I mean, you can just tell that it's a robot talking, it doesn't sound fluid, fluent. That's probably the worst thing about this movie, honestly, because I really enjoyed the rest of it. He transforms into Accelerate and runs. And this is me getting my... Uh, I always like uh, bar fight scenes over music, and this is Vector in a bar. Once again, the background is painted, which uh, seems to be a thing with this movie. But he's sitting there drinking. And Daphne joins in to ask him questions. Vector, uh, fortunately, did not fall to the AI disease, as he is voiced by my brother. And he is now in his new orange suit, but uh, currently in version 1 of that figure. I've upgraded it for uh, future versions, for future movies, sorry. He is made from the same uh, wire and uh, tinfoil method as Craven. And he had the same issues. And once again, Ash Ketchum is the one who does the bad things. He hits on Daphne here. Uh, and yeah, just angers Vector. That here is the figure for Matt Murdock. Basically his first appearance, but here he's not Matt Murdock, obviously. And there you go, you ripped up everyone in the bar. And Batman comes, because of course there was a fight in Gotham. Batman has to come and see what's happening. And that was my attempt at making AI whisper. Robots can't whisper, you can't tell them to whisper. So I just turned the volume down. And Batman throws a net on him. And Ben then reaches Gotham. You can see there a, a bottle of whiskey, because I um, I had a drinking problem back then. 
you know, also linking into my mental state. Uh, I am better now. He tells the Omnitrix to scan for traces of Lebowan and Ectoneurite DNA, uh, which are the species of Blitzwolf and Ghost Trick. And of course, no DNA traces found, because later we find out that those were actually illusions created by Mysterio, and Mysterio was not Mysterio, he was Anchor Plot. And that's Spectre's team once again, as he attacks Benten. He sees Benten turn from Accelerate to Ben, so yeah. There's the rat figure, made from a derived method of the one I used on Craven, because he uses uh, metal wires, but he has, uh, you know, the bulk of it is still tinfoil, but instead of masking tape, I used epoxy to build him, which is stronger, uh, makes for a smoother finish, makes him very heavy, and also was pretty hard to work with which means no articulation here in the elbows, or in the knees, or in the wrists, or ankles, nothing. So I never used this method again. And Wrath is, uh, uh, <laughs> is also a victim of the eye because I used Steven Ogg's voice for this. And, it, you know, Steven Ogg would kind of work for Wrath, but it would have to be actually Steven Ogg. And you can even see there my finger holding Wrath because why not? And they fight, of course. Daphne appears, and Factor wins the fight. Uh, ben transforms into Humongazor, which is actually voiced by me this time. With the Ben 10 Omnitex uh, theme song, which is actually just by uh, L'Orchestra Simatic. And Factor gets zipped away by Batman. Funnily enough, uh, Ben calls Factor an animal as an insult. insult. Vector is an animal, he's a lizard, and a Batman takes them into custody. Vector, of course, doesn't like that. And here is the first look at the Batcave, uh, which was a big set I built and I was excited for it, and then I had to move for uni and I couldn't take it with me, so it's gone. Yay! Those cages are actually just glasses, because, you know, but you can see here a better look at his triple monitor setup, because Batman is a true gamer. He is actually a streamer in his uh, spare time, that's how he, he's got the money. Maybe he even does OnlyFans, you know? Ben transforms, transforms into Ghost Freak but cannot phase through the cage. I don't know why he just can't, because plot. I voice Ghost Freak. No, I am doing this voice, because it, I thought it sounds creepy. I don't think it does. You can't ignore the look from Batman. If he tells you to do something, you do it. Here we get the better look at uh, his uh, right screen as he searches for DNA prints in Gotham. You can see here the Gotham map, uh, inspired mostly from the Arkham games, and his uh, like, uh, fast call list, I don't know how you call it, but the people he can uh, fast, oh, fast dial, that's what it was. You now he has the Sentinels, because he's Batman, he's prepared. You can also see Alfred here, Clark, uh, which is... Um, Superman, Barry, which is the Flash, and Gordon, which is Gordon, and there are also two names right there, but I can't, I can't uh, quite make them out. And uh, here we have the best visual effects in history, with the breaking news of uh, Cannonball dropping this your ship. And here comes the Batmobile, and he runs away. Yeah. The Batmobile was a 2D cutaway in using foam that I painted over, because the only other way. Uh, that they actually used later in the movie was a perspective trick with uh, a Hot Wheels Batmobile. I can't really afford one of those big Batmobile toys that is 6 inch scale. And here Batman fights Cannonbolt and gets defeated by one, almost. He transforms into Wildvine, gets punched, then out of nowhere comes Terror Spin. And Batman has to call reinforcements. You know, he really wouldn't because Batman is better than that, but uh, this was my way of having Ben, Daphne and Vector join in and actually forming the Guardians. Which they never they never called themselves the Guardians, but I needed a name for them. It was initially the Defenders, but I don't want to copy Marvel or DC. I want to make it my own. And here we uh, get some more information on the Omnitrix and the cages get lifted. Finally. Ben turns into Accelerate again, voiced by me, Accelerate, and runs away. Those are the aliens at the dealership. Uh, Daphne pukes because of the speed, and uh, Vector is angry. 
because he was taken by surprise. And here we see that Ben actually knows his aliens and how to use them in combat. So he turns into Cannonbolt and defeats Cannonbolt, which then rolls out to um, show that he is Cannonbolt. Did, did you catch that? Okay. And they start beating up the aliens and they turn to smoke, you know, after they get defeated because they are illusions. And now we see the Guardians on the left, you know, uh, Batman, Daphne, Ben and Vector facing off four aliens, Humongous or Armadrillo, Upchuck, and you didn't see it in the shot, but he's there. Uh, four arms and the theme song which I found on YouTube and that's pretty much the theme song for um, the Guardians. Okay, you still can't see forearms. Oh, I'm so stupid. Ben transforms into forearms. This movie was a long time ago. It's been two years and I can't believe how fast time went by. And now this is a fight scene. It's nothing, nothing crazy. And of course the robot makes a comeback. I told you that this was made uh, at the same time as Shantai, so uh, he appears here as well, just for Batman to grapple down. It also turns into green smoke. And here we see Mysterio, which is pretty clearly, if you pay attention, just the anchor with the globe on his head, these yellow things and the cape. I voice Mysterio and anchor, as I did in the first Toyland movie, so uh, yeah, no way I hear. Yeah, anchor was in prison, he was in Storm Vault after Toyland. And he learned magic there. We don't really know who from, but uh, he does. And of course, uh, after Shantai, because we are watching this right now in chronological order, apart from Trio, which is way, way before everything, uh, Storm Vault was uh, exploded and he escaped and he came to Gotham. He takes the helmet off and there he is, Anker Platt. Of course, Anker thinks that because he was a big mafia guy, basically a big gangster in Toyland, he thinks that uh, he is known in the whole world, he is not. And we have Alfred here on the voice comms, uh, voiced by Jeremy Clarkson. I don't think anyone would have thought of that, uh, but I did. I guess that's what uh, whiskey does with your mind, with your brain. And here uh, Ben, Vector and Daphne just finish off the villains, throw them into a big pile and they all turn to smoke. Batman comes out with Anker. Vector recognizes him because, uh, you know, in Toyland it's revealed that uh, Vector had, has, uh, Vector and Wu have been active in Toyland for a long time before Bubu disappeared, also dealing with Anker. So Vector, it makes sense that he would know Anker. Uh, there is the perfect perspective shot. It doesn't work well enough, in my opinion. Ben gives them some plumber badges for contact so they can work together in the future if they have to. Will it happen? You'll have to see. And this movie does have a post credit scene, which I'm going to skip to right now. This is the logo, very low res here, I don't really know why it's rendered like that. But uh, this is the uh, post credit scene, a great look, a much better look at the Batcave with Robin and Alfred in it. And here we see that Batman has been indeed keeping tabs on the Sentinels. Uh, well, not all of the Sentinels. Uh, Alan, Iron Man, uh, Bubo, Sonic and Vector. Uh, Vector being uh, in his suit right here, so it, it was perhaps he was perhaps added now. Uh, he doesn't have Hulk in here. Uh, perhaps, you know, he uh, does have him in the PC, but not on his screen right now. Who knows? Uh, this is an inter interesting shot, I think. I, I, I like this. They can be useful. Will they be useful? Wait and find out. But now, uh, we go on to my personal favorite project in Phase 2 so far. I, I'm not going to compare any of these to Toyland War or because that is the big uh, phase ending movie. So, yeah, let's go on to Superior Spider-Man. So, here we go, the sequel, basically, to Craven's Last Hunt. Starts with uh, starts pretty similar to uh, the Amazing Spider-Man 2. It even has the same theme song. Uh, the animation is much smoother. This is the first project where I used the 10 frames per second frame rate instead of the five, and it looks much more smoother. Looks much better. I even put more effort into the sets because I really loved this movie. I first posted the teaser to this right after I bought the Superior Spider-Man Marvel Legends figure because I knew. The second I had it in my hand, I had to do this movie. 
I love the comic, I love the story. It's one of my favorites of all time. And I'm glad I uh, could recreate it. And I still think, even after after the sentence 2, and now that I'm starting to write Twilight World on Earth, I still think this is my best work so far. Of course, I haven't finished World on Earth yet, but uh, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of this. I'm a big fan of myself on this. Once again, Ash Ketchum gets his ass handed to him because he's doomed to be a background character forever. But you can see the new figure for Spider-Man, which is a repaint of the SH figure arts upgraded suit from Far From Home with the spectacular Spider-Man head. This is still my favorite Spider-Man figure even though I broke it. And I am going to buy a replacement body because in Sentinel 2 I used a repainted Superior Spider-Man Marvel Legends body but I didn't quite like the proportions of that one uh, and I'm hoping the next one will be better. I have an idea in my head. But I was really really happy with this figure. And I am so sad that I broke it. When I was your age... Jeb returns to voice the character for the first time since the first Sentinels movie. Uh, this time he was able to do the job and what a job he does. He's great in this movie. I am really happy that he got to play Spider-Man. Spider Bully number one, voiced by me. You can, you can really tell the difference in animation here. Uh, this movie was a working project for over a year due to all the problems I've had in my life. You know, not really production problems, but problems in my personal life. Finishing high school, uh, breaking up with my girlfriend, moving to university in another city. University in its own is a struggle. And making this uh, was really hard. But I'm glad I got it done. And I still think that it is one of my best, despite all the problems I've had while making it. The phone ringtone is the one from Amazing Spider-Man 2 and it's also the one I have uh, on my personal phone because I'm a big Spidey fan. Of course, this is not a direct adaptation of the comic. This is inspired by uh, the big ideas are there, but I skip a lot of the smaller stuff I, stuff. I modify a lot of things to make it fit my universe and my vision for Spider-Man. And here comes the title screen, the title sequence. This time instead of webs, it's like abstract things. I painted all these uh, important moments in the relationship between Spider-Man and uh, Doc Ock. I drew them, you know, digitally. These are uh, photos from the Spectacular Spider-Man show, just redrawn. With the Spectacular Spider-Man theme song, which just slaps. Jeb as Peter Parker in Spider-Man, as I mentioned. I voiced Doc Ock, uh, basically because um, back then I knew I could hire voice actors, but being in my first year as a student, I really didn't have the financial intelligence to manage paying them because I do want to pay voice actors for their work. I, of course, I like it when they do it pro bono, but I do prefer paying them because they deserve it. Additional voice work by uh, Veridiana and Katush. Uh, Katush being my brother and Veridiana being a friend that I met in college and she helped me a lot with uh, this movie in particular and with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, short that I did, that's actually non-canon. Based on the comic run by Dan Slott and Ryan Stegman, of course, uh, they did a great job with that uh, comic run. I really, really loved it. So thank you, Dan, and thank you, Ryan. And you can see here uh, an old Doc Ock. Uh, you can tell by all the lines on his body. And here is the logo straight from the comic, because why change it if it's perfect? And here they are in Storm Vault 2. They rebuilt the prison. And of course, you've seen the movie. It does not end well for it. <laughs> for Storm Vault Man. But of course, on the walls, you will see a lot of references to other Spider Man and Toyland Universe villains. You can see here um, Alexei O'Hearn, uh, Rhino. And Bryce Jackson. You, you can't really see the Bryce, but I know it is Bryce. Bryce Jackson as Montana. And of course, then Shocker. This is a direct, direct reference to the Spectacular Spider-Man show where Montana becomes Shocker. There we have uh, Anchor Platt as Mysterio. Uh, Kurt Connor, uh, Kurt Connors as the Lizard. Uh, Leon Laza. I decided that his uh, last name Laza or Laza. And uh, Flint Marco as the Sandman. And that's the end of the corridor there. Uh, he presses the button which is next to uh, Sandman's cage. And here we get to see Otto Octavius in his old old man body. 
Uh, you can even see the tentacles are kind of uh, wrinkly. They are actually made with the uh, wire and uh, backing tape, boxing tape, not boxing, that's a sport. Like uh, the brown tape you use on packages and it makes them look a bit rusty. You can tell by his face that he's old. His clothes are even all uh, ripped up, kind of, because of the texture. And I tried to make him sound sick, like dying, because he is dying, his body is failing. So I actually pressed myself on the stomach while doing this voice, and it made it harder for me to speak. I think it works. I even uh, made my voice sound a bit different to my normal one just to sound like I'm a different person. Of course, the room is lit in red because dramatic. And here's the big reveal. Peter. Otto knew that Peter was Spider-Man a long time, because of course he was. Otto is a genius. Unironically, he is one of the smartest person, persons in the world. So of course he would know. But he was just waiting for the optimal time to reveal it to Peter, which is the actual line. He says, that is a pretty bad PNG paste of a security camera, but is there just for Peter to web up, you know, so that uh, others can see that he is Peter Parker. I guess he takes his mask off to talk to Otto with Helios. The dialogue is obviously changed from the comic. And here he actually changes their uh, minds. You can see Peter's uh, spine straightened out there. I think that was a cool little animation thing that I got to do. And you could actually, uh, now that uh, I remember, you could actually hear Doc Ock's theme from Spider-Man 2, the movie, play there during the mind swap. And those are Storm, of, Storm Vault guards. I think this is Mysterio with the Robotian helmet and some sort of shield. And you can't see the other one. And now Doc Ock wakes up. Oh, yeah, that's the Bruce Wayne figure with a mask and a Ben 10 gun, like alien gun. And uh, you can see the tentacles just attack and run as Peter Peter starts to wake up as well. But you, a little detail, after he smashes this guy into the ceiling, he puts him on the floor. Because he's Peter. And of course the Doc Ock uh, theme is still blasts in the background. Once again, no copyright for that, I don't know how. I This is confusing, I'm just going to refer to them as the action figure that they are. So Doc Ock smashes Peter, uh, Spider-Man Spider through a window. Spider-Man webs him up and drags him uh, out the window too, and now they are falling. Of course, Spider-Man saves himself, while Doc Ock uh, just hits the ground, and that's the end of him. And, with great power. and there you have it. And great responsibility. That's the, the Spider-Man line. I'm glad I got to put it in here as the thing that makes Otto realize what it means to be Spider-Man. And now, the story of Superior Spider-Man begins. With uh, Doc Ock in Peter's body, looking through his uh, life achievements, in a way, like through his files, and seeing that he's got no doctorate, no college. Because uh, Alan said in The Sentinels 2 that Peter didn't go to college. And he gets called by MJ, played, uh, as I mentioned in the title sequence, by Viridiana, the only girl voice actor I had at the time. So thanks to her. And he smirks. This was done using uh, the liquify tool in Photoshop because, you know, he's an action figure. I can't li liquify, in, liquify him in real life. And here's the second big action set piece where we see a lot of villains. That, okay, that's <laughs> that's the best we're going to get. That's Big Wheel, but the wheel is uh, a bit more elliptical and you can only see the legs from here. But I wanted uh, Big Wheel in this movie because where else was I going to fit him? We also see the lizard again because Storm Vault uh, was broken after the fight between um, Doc Ock and Spider Man. So Storm Vault is once again down to the ground and having to be rebuilt. That's the Living Brain, he's just built out of cardboard. And that's Molten Man, he's a custom of an old Power Rangers figure. Um, you can see on his face that he's got uh, these brown parts. That's because in my head canon in this universe, he is uh, created by infusion with pyronite DNA. So uh, I tried to give him a bit of pyronite, pyronite team there. But I really like the lava effect on him. He blows up car. And we also have the vulture. 
I'm, you can't just see the legs here, but you can tell that he is made from the old Spider-Man figure from Kraven's Last Hunt. And the Shocker, which is one of my brother's customs still. And the first appearance of the Superior Spider-Man costume. The figure was great during shooting, I really didn't have any problems with it. And uh, that is the first time I'm using this uh, visual effect for the Spidey Sense, not only the sound effect from Spectacular Spider-Man, I also blur the top and the bottom of the frame where the spider sense is activated. He jumps through the big wheel and webs it so that it uh, goes down, which is kind of smart. He dodges the fireball and throws a fire hydrant at him because you stop fires with the fire hydrant, obviously. He then gets grabbed by um, the vulture. And what follows is a very bare bones version of what happens in the comics. In the comics, in the comics, um, Spider-Man finds out that the Vulture has been using child labor, basically, to fuel his uh, crime doing. And he gets angry because uh, Otto was traumatized as a child and he attacks Vulture very violently and blinds him. Here, Otto just in, in a misjudgment, as this is pretty much his first Spider-Man outing, he just blinds Vulture out of anger, out of spite. He smashes his head into that thing. That was a Star Wars thing that came with the Yoda figure. The Yoda figure is now off. You should have retired a long time ago. He says, meanwhile also being old. Well, in a young man's body, but Otto is old. And here we see a very uh, non-Spider-Man thing, where he ignores the villains because they are pathetic. And that, that was the point I was making. Uh, now, uh, I'm glad I stopped on this uh, frame because this is not a good MG figure. The old MG figure uh, was alright, but it fell apart. This one I pretty much just uh, assembled out of whatever I could find and some epoxy and it doesn't look good. And it also fell apart. A lot. Like I had to glue the hands in because they would fall apart so, so much. Honestly, this is my least favorite scene of the movie, but I wanted to keep it in to showcase how Otto is very, very different to Peter Parker. Whereas Peter would uh, just jump into action whenever he saw something bad happen, Otto is more tactical, more planned, which is good. It's made it maybe the Batman way, but not the Spider-Man way. And here we go with the new City Science University, um, where, of course, uh, Otto goes to take to make Peter get his doctorate, and this is where we meet Anna Maria. And this is AI here. I once again used AI, but uh, Professor Lamis is a very small role. He only has like one line, if I remember correctly. I can't even remember whose voice I used. I'm sure it's in the credits, but uh, yeah, I'm not happy about using AI. I really am not. Anna Maria, also played by Verena. Uh, same figure, pretty much just uh, shortened her limbs. And so the same voice actor. She also voices Black Cat later, just so that I don't repeat myself. As I said, no, I didn't really know many women back then. And there we have the spider pots, which are a big thing in a comic. Uh, and of course they are a big thing here. Uh, they are what Otto uses to uh, control the uh, crime in the city, so that it doesn't spread too much. And of course, with his big realizations comes the... Oh, the Doc Ock soundtrack, because this is not a Peter thing, it's an Otto thing. This story is really about Otto Octavius, more than Peter Parker and Spider-Man. And it's great that we got this much tension on the character development of a villain in a story. You don't really get that uh, often. And here we have Harry Osborn returning as the Green Goblin. In the comic it was Norman, but for Norman I had other plans, and by that I mean Sentinels too. So I wanted the goblin here, because that's what uh, happened in the original comic. But I didn't want normal, so I took the next best, next best thing, Harry. And I think it also helped me write uh, Peter in, this, in the Sentinels 2 movie, because he was angry at Norman for killing Harry. Spoiler alert. It's too late. <laughs> Harry Osborn had, of course, heavily influenced by the Spectacular Spider-Man show. I think it's one of my most accurate head sculpts. Once again, AI for um, the butler. And I voice Harry, because I still didn't 
want to hire voice actors back then due to money issues. And this is how they set up their date. This is actually a thing that happens in the comic. You can see uh, the Peter Parker head sculpt was not made out of epoxy. It was made out of Play-Doh. I think I mentioned this in the first in direction to the first uh, to phase one. Uh, and it actually started to crack here in the left cheek because uh, these uh, these were um, I had to change rooms, you know, in between uh, the in between Craven's last hunt and this movie, uh, and this kind of got squished during transport and it cracked. And this is MJ's bar because she works at the bar here. This is also a thing in a comic. I think actually it was a nightclub then. And this could also work at a nightclub. I mean, this perfume bottle and this other bottle look quite fancy. And here comes Jim. Back then I didn't watch The Office. I have now, and it's great. And just coincidentally, I write the character that flirts with the girl in his workplace, and he is called Jim. You might recognize the voice. It's, uh, wait, what's his name again? Will Ornett, uh, who played Bojack Horseman in Bojack Horseman, and he also played Batman in the Lego Batman movie. And I used an AI that replicates his voice once again. This is uh, a stupid thing that I did. Of course, this uh, this scene just shows the cracks that are forming in the rela relationship between MJ and uh, Peter, who, Otto. But it mostly serves as the first appearance of Green Goblin in this movie, as he blows up the place. And there is a first look at um, the Green Goblin. Very comic look. I mean... Uh, inspired also by Fortnite, out of all things, uh, with the scales and um, the face. I really like the face, by the way, and the hood idea. This is a I like this figure, not that well articulated, but I liked it. And here is the date scene. This is where Peter, well, Otto and Anna Maria fall in love. That was supposed to be like liquid nitrogen that he gets in the sand and drops. That's what was it was in the comic, I think, but I didn't really know how to. Uh, show it so he just grabs a blue thing and gets hurt and here they kiss and it actually looks kind of sweet not gonna lie but here is the aftermath of the explosion at mj's bar you have uh, officer squirrel and officer shelby investigating and you saw their mj blocked under a table of course although things that because he's spider-man because he's soul scram he's above the police uh, he's not spider-man peter parker would never do that corrupt move Officer Shelby might actually be corrupt, you know? I mean, Otto does have the spider bots checking on everyone. But we're going to see a problem with those spider bots a bit later. That's a big slap. If you've ever been slapped by an angry woman, you know how that feels and it does not feel good. Oh, I just realized, literally right now, as I'm recording this, there's the Green Goblin figure. How did I not see it? How? Oh my god. Well, there you go. <laughs> Easter egg. Yeah, I don't really know. I mean, these hands were meant for holding the webs. These and the web hands were the only ones he came with. But these hands work surprisingly well as the hmm, the thinking uh, emote hand. He does not help Jim because he's pissed. He's auto, he has anger issues. And you can just bite that single scene right there single shot you can tell that the swing here is better than the one in Craven's last hunt and that's the black cat figure that i got out of an old spider woman figure i think maybe the 70s that i found at the flea market for one dollar and i just uh, turned it into the black cat i think it was a julia carpenter figure judging by the suit i'm not sure but yeah heavily modified and that's because it is a uh, black cat i did uh give her breast implants to to say it uh, diplomatically and that's how spider-man um cuts things off with black cat because of course she's going to be pissed after that after that and this is the second time the spidey the spidey no it's spidey spidey fights a lot of villains this is a compilation lizard shocker tito who just grabs because <laughs> he's small Mysterio too. Great figure that. It's the basic figure, not the Marvel Legends, but it's still awesome and I love that effect. 
that he has the triangle one and now he's watching TV and I don't show it but you bet that it uh, it's the mini camera <laughs> of course the voice uh, on the TV is also AI I am ashamed wow what was I thinking honestly this is Harry giving in fully to the Goblin this is a small scene that was also a teaser before the actual trailers this is where uh, Otto finishes the PhD work thing, like the thing he has to do to get a PhD. And of course, Anna Maria is happy for him. He is now living at her place, if you can't tell. And yes, she calls him slick. This is also a thing from the comic, because uh, Peter was uh, drew by... Was drawn? Was... Yeah. The artist on uh, Superior Spider-Man was Umberto Ramos. And uh, he drew Peter kind of... Kind of slick looking, kind of, hmm, not gonna lie. But, uh, so I took that to here. Of course, here he is based on the art from Spectacular Spider-Man, not from Humberto Ramos, but uh, it, he still looks good. You know, they have a spin, he kneels because she's short. She, she is short in the comic. So, yeah. And now this is a villain bar. This is also, also a thing that happens in the comics. A lot of comic inspiration from for this movie. This, uh, you could, uh... You could say this is also the beer cave that shows up in Shantai season three, because this is also where that is also where villains hang out, and Shocker is also in there. So Black Cat, the chameleon, is just the suited body with uh, the head I had for a custom Moon Knight figure that I threw away, and also Leon uh, making a comeback here with a jacket that says TNT on the back. You didn't expect him to come back so soon, did you? And Green Goblin comes. Rhino, voiced by my brother, who uh, really likes history, and uh, he does a better Russian accent than me. He also voices Chameleon, who is uh, also Russian. To take down this is my best Steve Blum impression. It's not nowhere near his excellence. I'm also voicing uh, Shocker, Doing my best South American accent, and also with a low voice, modif low pitch modifier, and that is Peter in a suit because of course he's on the date with Anna Maria, and the suit is the Mr. Knight figure from the Disney Plus show, and he just breaks the door because Anna Maria has been kidnapped by the Goblin, and this is another big action piece. Otto is now furious. He's on a rush. He wants to save Anna Maria from whatever she is whatever trouble she's in, but he has to face the sinister bunch, the troublesome three. Um, I didn't uh, mention it, but Rhino was also made uh, from the same method as Wrath, so he also couldn't stand because his, a lot of his weight was at the top, because he has very wide shoulders, so I had to use the stand with him. And it was, it was hard to edit out, so I didn't. And those are supposed to be the four arms that Otto has. Um, these are actually the attachment that came with the original uh, Spectacular Spider-Man figure. They were grey, I repainted them. And they look menacing aesthetically, but they are not articulated. So they're not really that good. This was supposed to be a slingshot. Spidey sense, of course, because he forgot about Leon was playing a bomb. There's the bomb. He throws the bomb and, and it explodes, making a building fall on, fall on him. Uh, of course, on Peter that wouldn't have happened, because he would have been careful and he has more experience. Otto has not been Spider-Man for a long time at all. And here we see Anna Maria tied to a chair. That looks actually quite convincing. That, speak up, dear. I can't understand the word you're saying. You might uh, think that that Harry sounds a bit British in his accent. That's because uh, I am from I am not from an English-speaking country, so I don't really have an accent. But you can also say that uh, Harry has an, a British accent because he's been in Europe. And here the Sentinels come to save uh, Spider-Man. You can see Sonic here, Iron Man in the suit. After I gave it a little repaint. And Tepig, who is still part of the Sentinels, even though in the Sentinels 2 he refuses to help them anymore because, you know, he's got to take care of Pipig. Uh, you gotta respect that. 
Here, Iron is voiced by an AI uh, that imitates the voice of Elon Musk. What else is there to say? And yeah, you can tell that uh, uh, Iron is out of scale again. He's like 7 or 8 inch scale. Uh, he just towers over Peter. And Peter is not a kid, not a teenager in this anymore. He's, uh, it's based like 7 or 8 years after the finale of Spectacular Spider-Man. And if we uh, think he was like 16 or 17 there, then he's about 24 or 25 here. So he's not really a teenager anymore. He's a young adult. I don't have any idea in the and Iron Man is like two, two heads taller than him. Friday is also voiced by an AI, but for Friday it makes sense because she is an AI. And there we see MJ tied to the rails. Uh, the rails do not continue. This was very low effort of me. The fact that Spider-Man is taking so long to untie that net is because it was actually tangled. And I I just I didn't wrap it around MJ, I just placed it on top and a little bit under to make it look like as if she was wrapped, but no, it's just sitting there and it's actually tangled. And here comes the train. So he just rips the the tracks with MJ and jumps away. As he gets a call from the goblin. That is also the Goblin theme from Spectacular Spider-Man, and they also use the same theme in the Sentinels too. Here he is, is at the Osdorp Mansion You're a lucky one, in a really big fight against the Green Goblin Go. to help to save Anna Maria. And there comes the glider, similar to uh, Spider-Man 1 the movie, and Anna Maria sacrifices her herself to save Spidey. But of course, Anna Maria dies here, which causes Otto to have a mental breakdown, which I also think a lot of people uh, here can um, relate to. And now we get the scene that I'm really glad I wrote it, because I initially didn't want it to be in here, I just wanted to transition straight from Otto to Peter, like it did in the beginning of the movie, but I'm glad I did this, uh, because it's a really heartfelt moment between the two. Each represented in their um, iconic suits as Spider-Man. Of course, me voicing Otto, as I did in the beginning of the movie, but this time without uh, me pressing on my stomach to seem sick, because this is just a consciousness, and Jeb fa uh, voicing Peter. Of course, Peter there was surprised at, the, at hearing that name Osborne, because as far as he knew, Norman was dead, and Harry was gone. Uh, of course, Otto doesn't tell him uh, who the goblin is, but Peter finds out on his own later. There is no possible way you can... And of course, Peter does know how it is to lose a loved one. He knows it very well. I didn't. I lived with it. And now you're gonna have to do the same. It's what we do. I think that little thing there really sounds up being Spider-Man. I, yeah, as I said, this is my favorite work so far. And now Peter gains back his body. Of course, Peter calls Anna Maria a friend because he does not have feelings for her. Otto had. Uh, in the comic, Anna Maria doesn't die. She continues, then he finds out, uh, uh, then she finds out about Otto and Peter switching minds and it's a bit messy. And that's why I decided to have Anna Maria die here as it is a stronger, it has a stronger impact on Otto, which um, leads to Peter gaining back his body. And I don't really have much use for her after this movie. Uh, and they really didn't have much use for her after the Superior Spider-Man comic run ended either. Fun, fun fact that I'm also realizing just now, this movie came out in 2023, which is 10 years after the comic run started. So there, yeah, there you have that. He now sees that uh, Otto has been working through his uh, things, and you even saw right here, I'm going to put it on the screen, um, the Iron Spider Helmet, which was uh, something that uh, Otto was working on. Will that uh, turn to be useful? Who knows? And there you go. The iconic red and blue is back. And the amazing Spider-Man 2 theme there. Uh, a lot of references there in the 
graveyard, but I'm not going to uh, try and stop uh, and talk about all of them. I've stopped on stopped on this frame, so let's uh, talk about these. These are basically all the things. Uh, I I needed all of names, so they are all people that died important both to the world of comics and movies and things that I like. But first, uh, you can obviously see the person from Craven's Last Hunt. We also have here the Vector one, uh, Chadwick Boseman, you know, the the actor who played Black Panther and he died, unfortunately. Um, Kurt Cobain, one of my favorite singers. Um, Ayrton Senna, great uh, F1 driver, and Charlie Whiting was also um, F1 personality that died. So, um, yeah, they are there just to fill out the grave, but I wanted them to be people that uh, I respect and I like and I uh, I miss. And that's a shed. Hey this is also the other thing I really don't like about this movie, apart from the AI voices and the restaurant scene. This sad attempt at uh, Photoshop. I mean, let's just look at it for a good second and, um, yeah. <laughs> Never doing that again. That's a pretty convincing shovel though. But here comes Peter back in action. Of course, another difference between Peter and Otto. That's a first. A shame it's gonna end for you, Osborne. Peter makes quips. That was supposed to be a tree. It's a spray can. But this is some uh, of some of my best fight animation that I've done like in all time. And here we have the reveal that um, Harry is the goblin and not Norman. I actually had to, uh, because this was air dry clay, I, uh, when I made this figure this was really early. Uh, I didn't yet use the epoxy so I had to literally cut it with the exacto knife and rip it off to be able to change the head. So this is uh, the last scene I shot with Harry, with the, the goblin figure. Peter is of course shocked. Harry is mad about his father's dying. Anyone would be too. And now this double spin kick um, finishes off Harry. And Peter, he is also hurt, but he wants to help Harry. That, that That's another big difference between Otto and Peter. Peter also, always wants to help his villains. Otto just wants them to be gone, to be defeated. That's why in the comic he even kills some villains. And here is, he is at the hospital trying to reconnect with MJ, but it doesn't work out, of course, because MJ doesn't know about Otto taking control. It's a choice to tell her, but, uh, you know, it doesn't go well. And here he is, the final scene of the movie, apart from the post-credit scene. Peter comes in to talk to the Sentinels about his actions. Uh, you have Tepic, Iron Man and Sonic, the only remaining Sentinels. And of course, after that, Tepic also leaves which uh, leads to the shortage of Sentinels members in Sentinels 2. I'm still the one voicing Tepic, and I always will be. But for Sonic, I once again used AI. Oh, God. Um, I uh, we used an AI that imitates Jason Griffith, the original actor, uh, voice actor for Sonic from Sonic X and other Sonic titles. And of course, he tells the story very bare bones. And who would believe that? I mean, really, who would believe it? And let's skip through to the post credit scene. So the uh, post uh, post credit scene is really simple, and it sets up directly the movie after, which is uh, Sentinels 2. Uh, it is Harry in the hospital, and next to him we see a goblin bomb, and it's implied that it blows up, which it does. Next up, we have my second favorite project of Phase 2. Pretty, pretty much on the same level as Superior Spider-Man, but I don't know, I, I'm just a bit more attached to the character of Spider-Man. Uh, this is Shantai, season 3 and the final season for Shantai. Um, this was my quickest uh, project to write and to actually finish writing, because this took me one night. Um, and the uh, Writing process was similar to the writing process for Toyland, where I just uh, grabbed all my action figures and thought of them in a sort of situation in a movie. Uh, I did this, a similar thing with this. I had the basic idea of Bubo and some uh, characters going after uh, Leon and some villains, and then I just looked at my collection on display and picked out who the two 
big teams were. And, I don't know, inspiration just kind of hit me right in the face. And I finished writing this in one night. I was just going and going and going, writing scene after scene, line after line. And it was actually an amazing experience for me. And one that I hope I get to have more and more often. Because as a writer, I think that's that's a pretty good feeling. The tone in this uh, season is pretty different to season one and two. Season one uh, didn't really have a tone in itself. It was mostly just establishing uh, Bubo and uh, Vector and a bit Kangu too. Then season two was uh, actually quite dark uh, compared to season one at least. Uh, as it delved into Buo dealing with uh, the guilt of killing Vector. But this season, it's uh, much more light in tone. And I think that really works well with the characters I've chosen. So let's go. Uh, we start here at the police department. Uh, Matt Murdock, who is going to make his official debut, debut here. He's uh, currently negotiating uh, a deal with the... I have just I have so little knowledge of the law system with the guys who deal the punishments. Uh, so he's trying to get Bubo to be able to do the uh, undercover mission instead of going to a prison somewhere because you know Stormwald is destroyed again. That is a new figure for Bubo, um, well articulated, but still not perfect, uh, which is why I made the new one that you are going to see in Toyland War on Earth. Were on Earth. Matt Murdock here on the right, voiced by my brother Katush, the same guy who voices Vector. Uh, Vector is not in this season because this show happens at the same time as um, Sentinels 2, which is why we, you don't see Bubo in that movie and Vector in this movie. The only character just that appears in both is Alan. Um, and that th this was intended from the start when I was writing both these and uh, Sentinels too. Uh, the figure for Matt is a Matt Smith uh, figure from Doctor Who. I don't know what number Doctor he is, but it's him. And I just uh, made him a cane out of some plastic stick I found somewhere, and gave him glasses and sculpted the tie. Nothing much. I don't think. That Katush will stay as the voice for Matt Murdock. Uh, he's not doing a bad job here. He just uh, isn't really what I imagine, what I envision Daredevil to sound like in my universe. But he's doing a fine job here. This was also my first uh, project uh, to be shot with my new uh, camera instead of my phone, my Nikon D3000. Actually, the first project that is part of the Toyland universe because I uh, first did the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles short that time it's going to be later at the end of this uh, reaction video uh, that was just to test the camera and I decided I like it so I uh, started using it for everything and it's a good camera I'm pretty happy with it I actually really enjoyed even working on this because it's it has a lot of moments that I really enjoy seeing and you know, uh, watching come to life. And, of course, a lot of characters that are close to me. Uh, Bubo, who is my personal creation, and he is one of my favorite characters that I have in this universe. I have a strong personal link to him, so uh, I'm happy to have him as a character. Harley also appears in this show, and she is one of my favorite characters of all time, and I was so excited to have her appear in the universe because uh, that's something I really wanted but uh, I couldn't really find a way so I was happy to include it here because it makes sense yes she's a Batman villain so it would make sense for her to be in Gotham in the USA but you know she's Harley she could have just traveled or whatever Agreed. and here I am voicing Squirtle again I will escort you to the police station where you will receive the mission briefing he's really enjoying life as an officer and there we go, that's the Black Ops team. Uh, and it, uh, is, it is made of two actual, well, one's an officer, Squirtle, uh, not Squirtle, Melt, and uh, Vince uh, the Rat, who is a Black Ops expert, and also two convicts uh, in Bubble, of course, he is considered a convict here, 
even though he's a sentinel. And uh, Anker Platt, who in this show goes on a quest to become Mysterio, to earn the name. Uh, Anker, voiced by me, of course, as, I, as he always has been. Meowth, also voiced by me. And Vince, sadly, is another victim of AI. Uh, luckily, in this uh, project, I did start to uh, talk to more voice actors, so this show is not as affected. But yeah, uh, the voice for Vince is uh, uh, Toby Maguire with a uh, low pitch modifier on it. And it uh, has its moments where it sounds pretty obvious that he's AI. And yeah, I wrote Vince as a very by the book guy because uh, he fit that role in the story. You, you know, that driver within Bubo who likes to do things kind of around the rules, uh, basically to do what's right, even if it's not uh, necessarily legal, which is why he is on board with this Black Ops thing, which is um, at the limit of legality. But Vince is very, very by the book. And I think that's, uh, that's a good uh, character trait to have in this universe. And of course, Alan, because of course, this show also have, has a lot of car shots because I really enjoy animating them. I used to do it a lot back when I was younger and I'm that was pretty much my first experience with uh, uh, stop motion, doing car stop motions uh, inspired by some NASCAR stop motion YouTubers that uh, I'm going to put, put their names on screen, my biggest inspirations. Shocker still voiced by me. I also enjoyed writing Shocker in this show. I just had a blast writing everything about this and uh, making it. There you can see the beer cave. Um, the name I came up just on the spot. So, um, yeah. It, it is a bar where villains hang out. And that is inspired by the comics. In the Spider-Man comics, I don't remember exactly which run, but uh, there is there is a bar or a, a pub or whatever where the villains hang out between their uh, fights and whatever. I think, I don't know exactly the run, but I know Dan Slot is the writer because that's a very Dan Slot thing. And there, let me see if I can catch the frame. I've left even a menu for uh, those interested. Uh, you've got the uh, beer, whiskey, vodka, tequila, uh, kamikaze, which is a shot. Uh, you, uh, you can also get uh, wine at $15, that's quite expensive. And Zoro, if you're wondering, is a local shot uh, here in the city that I'm at, that I'm, at, uh, that I'm in with the uh, uni. I'm going to put a picture of it on screen. It's uh, quite good, actually. But if I tell you what it's made of, you, you're going to refuse it, so I won't. And uh, we get a lot of villain cameos here. Uh, Dr. Animal, who doesn't speak in this, um, in this show, but he is here. Uh, this is the Playmates figure, based on the reboot, I think, of Ben 10. We also have the original Mysterio and Molten Man again, playing pool. On the same pool table that you might have seen in the villain bar in uh, Superior Spider-Man. So, um, yeah, there you go. It's the same place, confirmed. Even Harley Quinn there, just uh, downing a shot. Let me see if I can catch that. Yeah, there she is. Uh, the body uh, actually was quite different in the first uh, version, but I did reshoots after I made this custom because the first body was extremely bulky. Um, the head uh, is not really there because this was hand sculpted by me. And right after I published the show, I made a new head. Well, I repainted the Haley Steinfeld head from the Disney Plus Hawkeye figure. And it looks way better because obviously it's made by a more talented person. But uh, it's okay right here. Yeah, it's just okay. And here, uh, Ankar will try to talk to the original Mysterio because he's a fanboy. My name is Ankar Plot, but I also know as Mysterio. And uh, you're going to hear now. I don't. And who are you? Uh, Mysterio, the original one, is voiced by AI again because I couldn't really find someone and I don't think I make a good Mysterio. I also voice a lot of characters. So I turned to AI again and I used uh, Jeff Goldblum with uh, a low pitch modifier. I do regret using AI, by the way. 
not only because it sounds weird in the project, but it's also not fair for the voice actor community, you know? I mean, if if uh, voice AI gets too realistic, I mean, they are basically obsolete because you can just use AI for everything. So I hope that doesn't happen. And here we see uh, Meowth uh, hitting on Harley. Meowth being like this hopeless romantic or, romantic or whatever, uh, was the new character trait that I introduced in this show. I think it works. Uh, Meowth needed some personality because the only sh uh, the only movie he really has a speaking role in is uh, Pokemon vs. Bakugan, which, uh, as you know, I'm not a big fan of. So yeah, he I really prefer him here. And Harley... Voiced by the amazing Kitty Hate Machine. Uh, she was amazing to work with. She does an amazing, just purely perfect voice for Harley. I I don't see someone playing Harley. I, did, I mean, I don't hear someone playing Harley. I, I hear Harley Quinn, so I'm really glad I got to work with her. And I hope she can return for future projects as Harley because she's just perfect for the role. I'm, I'm in awe at her performance. <laughs> And yeah, Shantai, uh, the, I mean Bubo, wait, I'm trying to sound like Vince. Bubo and Vince are pretty much the team leaders of this Black Ops team because Meowth doesn't really do much and Unkar, Unkar is just useless. <laughs> Plain and simple. Bryce uh, being the real name uh, of Shocker, Bryce Jackson. And uh, here we have the return of Leon with his jacket that he or in Superior Spider-Man, but this time he comes back with a speaking role, the main villain role even. Um, and returning to voice him is again Brian K. Scott, doing an amazing job as he does every time. I'm glad to have him back and he just fulfills the role. And that's the end of the first episode. Um, unfortunately, this uh, in this show I also forgot to write a uh, post credit scene. I somehow I make it a point for me to put one for every project but i seem to keep forgetting let's go to episode two now which is where the plot really thickens this was uh, episode one was more of a setup you can see here mouth and anchor just hangover this is straight up a uh, hangover style uh, like in the movie i mean because they got drunk as harley says later in the episode and they are here alone because everyone else left. They are pretty much the comedic duo of this show. And yeah, Mysterio finds them, he doesn't know what what's going on, he just uh, stayed behind to lock the beer cave because all the enemies are out with Leon. So he spawns a car and later on you're going to hear this car, but actually I'm going to talk about when we get there, a lot more car shots because I love them. This is another scene I really enjoyed uh, doing and writing. The car scene with these two and Harley. Harley shows up in a moment. Also, uh, just one detail that you might not catch on and it's not really that obvious. Um, Vince here drives an Alfa Romeo. Uh, I think it's a Giulia. And I actually, when making the interior, I looked at interior photos of the Alfa Romeo Giulia to make it as accurate as possible. Uh, I don't think anyone knows this that but i that's why i'm here that's why i'm doing this this is also a joke that i just really wanted to put in with bubba being a redhead he is just red <laughs> lots of energy put by kitty into the role of harley quinn i love her as a voice actor top tier cgi right there just amazing groundbreaking even Palkia here is also voiced by AI because uh, I don't have that big of a range. And uh, since he has like two lines, I uh, also felt that I shouldn't hire a voice actor. Now that I think about it, I should have. I really should have. And here they're in the forest. This forest encounter, like forest scene with all of them, is also something that I had in mind even when writing episode one. As I said, this was just one big writing session. Of course, I did come back uh, in later days to uh, finish up and touch up on some of the areas in the script, but 
overall it was the same from start to finish and it was just one big thing. Uh, Brian there makes a mistake uh, saying Amino instead of Animal. I could have asked him, asked him to asked him to change it but also Leon doesn't really care. He just needs people to do his dirty work. So who cares if... I mean he doesn't care uh, if it's Amino or Animal. And yes, he does take Bubo with him because he's still uh, half suspicious, but he still wants to push Bubo into his darker side because that's what uh, that's how Leon is as a character. And yes, I did add a fire sound effect whenever uh, Molten Man was on screen. And yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. That engine sound is actually the sound that um, the car Mysterio has found. That's a, a Fiat. 126p would make it's a two cylinder engine it's small and it sounds like that i always try to be accurate with engine sounds even though no one really pays attention but something that uh, gives me uh, a good sentiment I, like you can tell there that it's, it's a you know he says the name of mysterio you know a normal person will say the name Mama. of course just... leon uh, likes to be mysterious, but also is still suspicious of Bubo, so he doesn't tell him the plan. Nobody actually knows the plan. He reveals it later in the warehouse scene, a whole episode later. And here the whole mission goes bad. It goes down. Because um, they talk about Vince's very, very real past as a mercenary. Uh, he references the big man, the big man being, of course, uh, a reference to Spectacular Spider-Man, where the big man was Tombstone. Of course, Tombstone does not appear here, but it, it's nice to mention him, because he's a part of Spider-Man's uh, past, and my version of Spidey is based on Spectacular Spider-Man, which is the show that I grew up with. Pola is another fictional city in Thailand, and now the fight starts. Of course, uh, everything is uh, going bad here, uh, they are all fighting with each other and Dr. Animal is playing with a monkey because he's Dr. Animal, he doesn't fight hand to hand who knows what what's going to happen to that monkey I mean, he's Dr. Animal, he might turn it into a frog or a frog he really has um, a thing with frogs, doesn't he? Fucker, what the hell are you doing? That is also the harshest word in a uh, Thailand series so far, uh, up until this specific point. And of course, Harley's an outsider, she doesn't care, she just enjoys the action. And now, Anker tries to live up to his potential, I mean to his dream as Mysterio. I could have reduced the volume on that uh, magic sound effect, because you can't really hear anything else. And of course, Multoman tries to join in the fight, but he can't. This is a forest. Forests don't do well with fire, just ask Australia. Now Bubo trips, and it's all over. And now they pick up and leave, and they put their final plan into action. Now, normally I would go to episode 3, but as I said, this show is simultaneous to Sentinels 2. And Sentinels 2 happens in between episode 2 and 3, so let's go check out that movie. Now, Sentinels 2 is a project that took me a lot, a lot of time to finish, uh, or maybe not, but it uh, certainly felt, it certainly felt like a lot of time. First of all, I had to move a lot of stuff when I was shooting this movie, because I was moving from my original home to the town I'm in for uni, and that was a hassle and also I had some trouble finding voice actors for this uh, because this is this was the first project where I decided no more AI because it's just not good but that left me with a lot of gaps I did not want to voice all of the characters so I reached out um, Jeb was supposed to return as Spider-Man but he had some personal issues so I had to uh, choose another one, and you're going to see who in a bit when you get to him. Uh, Brian K. Scott also comes back to voice Norman Osborn. He was supposed to also play Green Goblin, but he also had some issues. So you can see how it was a bit chaotic. But I'm 
happy that I managed to get this thing out and in my opinion it's good. I mean it's uh, certainly on the same level if not a bit better, a bit more better if uh, if I'm honest than the first Sentinels movie. Perhaps not, I'm not as proud of it as I am of Superior Spider-Man or Shantai but I still enjoy it. My god that's loud. And we begin with the funeral of Harry Osborn who died or was presumed dead in the post credit scene of Superior Spider-Man and is confirmed dead here. And of course Peter goes through a hard time with this. Uh, I also had uh, Gerd Thompson um, join in. He um, is voicing Iron Man here, Tony Stark and Iron Man. He first appeared in Trigger the series, but I'm doing that at the end of this because it's a prequel to everything that even happens before the first Toyland movie. Uh, but I also got him to join in here as Iron Man, and he does a good job. I mean, uh, it's better than having an AI, you know, Elon Musk, eh. or me doing the voice and basically having a dialogue with myself for the whole movie, because um, in past movies, it, uh, when Iron Man and Alan talked, they sounded pretty similar, so it's great to have him here, and he does a great job. Uh, I think that those two lines are important because it shows that Tony has a tendency to be more empathic towards others as he doesn't want to put pressure on Peter, but Alan is much more focused on the mission, on his duty as the captain of the police and pretty much the person responsible of the sentinels and the security of the country. So he kind of forces, wants to force Peter into being a superhero, into being a sentinel. Peter is not an official member of the Sentinels, he just kind of is there. And here we see Peter is affected. I think we've all been in this situation where we get home, we just fall into the bed and just want to punch a wall. I don't do it. I don't think the neighbors would be very happy with that. Neither are Peter's. But we've all been in that situation, I'm sure of it. Sorry. And that is the first time we hear the new voice actor for Peter Parker and Spider-Man, Kenneth Cooper, and uh, yeah, they do an amazing job here. Uh, I I find that their voice is um, a mix between Josh Keaton's, who of course voiced Spider-Man in Spectacular Spider-Man, so great, and also a bit of Mauricio from Roundtable, um, who I also think is a good voice for Spider-Man, if he ever decides to get into that. But I'm really glad with uh, Kenneth's job here. I'm so, so impressed by his work and I, I am happy that I got to work with him too. And I hope he returns in future projects because he's great. And there we see uh, the tree. I, I just did um, air quotations. The thing that Harry smashed to in the final battle of Spear Spider-Man that was supposed to be a tree. Next with his goblin mask. As the new Goblin, this is the first shot we see of him, comes in to wreak havoc on New City. And this is the explosion scene at the hospital. I try to look to make it look both hospitally, so it's very white, but also explodey. So it just it's, it's very messy. There's a lot of things laying around. I don't think it works, but uh, there's context given. However, we see three new members of the police force. Uh, we have Terry, uh, Terry and Rocky, the two uh, dogs that work in forensics because, you know, they're dogs, they can find clues easier. Uh, and we also have Sherlock, who is the detective of the Thailand Police Department. He, and yes, it was Sherlock, it, it was the hamster ever since I was a kid. May I have a look at those metallic and yeah, that is my best attempt at a British accent. I cannot do a British accent. You cannot, in fact, look at the details on that. And this is the first time we see Spider-Man in, in this movie with a new figure. So far it's been, uh, what, four appearances of Spidey and three different figures. And it's going to be a new one in Turn and World on Earth. So, uh, yeah, Spidey figures do not last long in the Turn and Universe. But uh, this is just a repaint of the superior Spider-Man figure. 
Uh, it's a body model that works. is It's well articulated, a bit odd, oddly pro proportioned, but uh, it does the job. And yes, of course, a big thing in this movie is that nobody believes that the goblin, I mean Norman, as the goblin is back. And of course, Harry is that, so he's definitely not the goblin anymore. And yes, uh, that fight they are talking about is from the final episode of Spectacular Spider-Man. Because we see basically Norman being blown up in that uh, pit of goblin bombs. But then, of course, in the last scene, we see him flying away with blonde hair. Which is why I also gave him blonde hair in this you're going to see in a bit. That something is also intuition, you know, but you could also make a case for it being spider sense. I mean, who knows how advanced it is. Peter is older here than he was uh, back in the original animated show. I mean, it's revealed that this movie, later it's revealed that this movie is eight years after um, the finale of, uh, of uh, Spectacular Spider-Man. So that would make Peter about 25. 24, 25 years old, which I think I mentioned already. Of course, the thugs here are basic male number one and uh, Jeremy Renner. I mean, Clint Bart Barton. But this is where we see Vector again for the first, uh, for the second time actually in the orange suit, but this time with an updated mold. Instead of being just uh, wire and uh, tinfoil, it's uh, Lego joints from like Lego Technic and epoxy for the body except for the head the head i kept as is but i'm glad i uh retooled him because now he's much much better to work with katush of course returning as vector his original character and he does a good job he's drawn a lot both as a person because you know he time passes uh but also as a vice actor he does a better job here than he did in previous projects so good on him. I also liked animating that car crash. Sonic here is voiced by me. I wanted someone else to voice him, but I just couldn't find someone to play him. And the time kept passing and passing, and I just wanted to get the movie out so that I could f also finish um, Shantai. I did end up posting the final episode of Shantai before Sentinels 2. Um, I voice Sonic here, and it's quite hard <laughs> to do the voice of Sonic because he is very energetic and he speaks really fast. And as a non native English speaker, it's hard for me to speak fast. And also because he is very energetic, I had a tendency to speak really loud. So that was a lot of fun in editing to fix my voice clipping. Some weird vigilante from Batman told him about your whereabouts. Batman reference. So, um, Batman has contacted Tony, we know that. And Batman also knows where Vector is. He is currently in Tora, you know, the town near the Kangu Temple. And yes, they are lone sentinels, this is a thing. Because basically all that's left, uh, all that was left, uh, as we saw in Superior Spider-Man, were Tony, Sonic and uh, Tepig. But uh, in this movie you're going to see in a bit, Tepig resigns. He wants to focus on his child, on Peepig, and that's respectable, you know. I mean, he wants to be a good father. And yes, um, Tepig there was watching Hotel Bakugan, the movie, which is also on this channel, but is not part of the universe. As Alan comes to try and recruit him, but it does not work. Tepig does not want anything to do anymore with that life. Of course, this is the first time Vector meets Bruce. Because Bruce was introduced in the first Sentinels movie, and in that movie, Vector was gone. So um, he didn't get to meet him until now. Uh, of course, I voice Bruce uh, doing my kid voice, my high pitched voice, but also pitched even higher to sound even more like kid. And the figure is still the Ben 10 reboot little thing. It changes soon as Bruce grows up. And this is where we see Norman Osborn. And, oh, I just got the frame with uh, full focus. You can see that he is indeed blonde. The head is actually null. I uh, cut his hair and uh, repainted it and all. And I think it does 
uh, make for a good Norman Osborn here. He does look evil. Long time. And there you have uh, the first time Brian voices Norman Osborn here. He does a great job. He sounds like a menacing guy. And not really like Norman sounded in Spectacular Spider-Man, but you know, it's been eight years. I think Brian is great at doing villain voices. I also improved the fighting sound effects from my usual ones, I did some new ones. And also the voice actors helped a lot with the grunts during the fights, which add to the authenticity of uh, the fight scenes. And yes, um, Norman, just like in the comics and just like everywhere where he's portrayed correctly, uh, does not care about his son. He just cares about himself and his business, business and his villain thing, but he does not care about his son. To him, the son is just a waste of time, a disappointment, and just uh, useless, pretty much. Which is not correct. Harry has a lot of potential. Harry is actually a good person. Unfortunately, he was corrupted by revenge. Uh, and Norman is just a bad person. You're never meant to relate to Norman. If you do relate to Norman, you're, you, I think you have a problem. <laughs> And this is the second big explosion that uh, Norman causes Peter's apartment as he falls into a dumpster, which is actually uh, the case for my uh, reading glasses and PC glasses and just overall glasses. And he wakes up at Sentinel's Tower, you know, being taken care of. He did fall a few stories and he does have high spider powers, but he jumped from an explosion. He got beaten up by the goblin. You know, he needs some medical attention. Not to mention his mental state, which is just all over the place. And yes, Norman is also presumed dead until he actually shows up and he is not dead. And this is at Peter's apartment, uh, also looking for evidence. Seeing the fragment of the bomb, as Sherlock just said. And uh, there's the second appearance of the no wait is it the second no it's the third because it showed up in superior and in Shantaisen 2 this is the third appearance of the mark 48 um, but this is where it actually gets some action and yes Norman is feared because even in spectacular he was quite dangerous and this is the reveal of the full uh, Norman goblin suit inspired by uh, mostly the Raimi movie because it's a lot more technic tactical, you know, more uh, Power Rangers-ish, which is a thing. This is actually a Power Rangers figure that I modified. You can um, find out more in my 2023 collection video. But I'm really proud of the head. The head is a lot more goblin-y. Voiced by me, of course, because Brian uh, couldn't. Unfortunately, do the voice for him uh, as well. And I don't do the greatest job, but I do sound pretty mentally insane. I don't know if that's a compliment. And yes, that is the same alarm, if, we, if you remember, as in the first Iron movie. Except there it was in the police department here, it's in the Sentinel's Towers. Sentinel's Tower. But I thought that was a nice easter egg. And yes, Friday is an AI voice, but once again, I think that works because Friday is an AI. And here Peter just breaks down. His life is ruined by his best friend dying. He was absent from his own life for a good period of time. MJ is gone because Otto destroyed that relationship. Uh, he's currently not fit to fight. Uh, Norman is back and just... Uh, who knows what he's going to do. So Peter just has a complete mental breakdown. And I think we can also relate to that. I think uh, we've all had our fair, our fair share of mental breakdowns, especially in the last few years. I know I have. And just a really great job by Kenneth there, just exposing himself and being vulnerable. Not many would do that. I know I can't fake cry and make it sound as good as he did. I just can't. And here we have the Sentinels group shot. Uh, in the meantime, Bruce, of course, learned to somehow 
I mean, not really control his powers, but m control them better than no control, like he did. He was in Sentinels One. A smaller number, just four of them uh, this time. So it's not the best of times for the Sentinels here. And um, that was a pretty quick action sequence. If you couldn't tell what happened, I'm going to try to stop. So Sonny comes in right here and uh, push, uh, grabs Goblin and jumps off the building with him. But you see here the glider comes in and swoops Goblin. So Sonic is left free falling and Iron Man catches him. And now Vector and Hulk could do a combo move. Vector jabs onto the glider and he destroys the glider. So that's the last we'll see of it. And now Vec uh, sorry, Goblin versus the Hulk, the Battle of the Greens, which I make a joke out of. You know, Green Troll, Green Elf. They fall through the building because Hulk is strong. He's the Hulk. I'm also the one voicing Hulk, doing my best... Uh, Battle scream, but I won't do it right now because it's late and my neighbors would hate it. So sorry. And this is how you defeat Hulk when he's young, just a bomb in his mouth. And yes, that is the same Sentinel Steam from Sentinels One. It's it's the definitive Sentinel Steam that I will use, and I love it. Just wanted to mention that. And here is Peter finish uh, working on the antidote because he wants to help. It's his responsibility to help. And we see that Alan does have a supportive side here. He's just he's not just the guy who respects rules and is very strict. He does have a sensitive side side. He can empathize, he can be good to others. And keep in mind that while this movie is happening, he's also taking care of the black station. Those are the wrecks of the building after it exploded, and these are mind controlled people controlled by Goblin's toxin. And you can see here the people who, so let's see, who are they? Um, Clint Barton again, Miss Marvel. Uh, this is the su basic suited body with the Anna Maria head on. Uh, we also have Matt Murdock without the glasses and Goku. One of these is not like the others. And Spider-Man is back, that's a heroic moment, with the antidote kicks Goblin in the face, he is back. You could now say that he's part of the Sentinels, but not really. I mean, you'll have to see. And Earthquake, Hulk is alive because, of course, um, the Hulk part of Bruce Banner wouldn't let Bruce Banner die, even if a building falls on him. So this is pure adrenaline here, fueling the Hulk transformation. And he just attacks. Uh, Goblin smashes into a wall, and that's when the adrenaline wears off. So Sonic rescues him, and it's time for the final showdown between Spidey and Goblin, again. And this is a powerful moment as well, with Norman still not managing to break Peter, even at his worst, Peter's worst. That's just how strong Peter is, even in his hardest moments, he still cannot be broken by Norman or anyone. Yeah, Storm of, Storm of Vault is still destroyed. It's just the Storm Vault curse. And yeah, Peter forgot. That's what he says. He actually didn't know because he was dying right then. No, Otto's dead. And here Peter comes, takes his mask off because uh, he trusts Iron Man, Vector and Sonic and Norman already knows because he visited Peter in his apartment and the trust him as Spider-Man, so, you know, but we see here that he's completely drained, he's mentally and physically exhausted, so he just faints into Iron Man's arms. I would say that's a very warm embrace, but metal is not warm, so it's probably very cold. That is the logo for the Sentinels too, it's just the Sentinels with the Roman too. However, for this movie, I did remember to include the post credit scene, which is going to be your first clue to Toyland World on Earth. So let's check it out. We see a robot again. 
and we hear Trero. I mean, we knew he wasn't really dead at the end of Benton Omnitech. And yes, that is what Toyn and Warrenart will focus on. Trio. It will be more clear whenever I get the trailer out or more info, but that movie is a very big work in progress. And I think it will be at least a year until I can make some good progress on it. That is why I'm making this video now on phase two without Warrenart, because, you know, Next up, it's time to finish off Shantai as well. Um, this happens pretty much during Sandals 2. Episodes 1 and 2 were before, this is pretty much at the same time. It's basically the reason why Alan was not present in the final scene with Goblin handcuffed in the Sentinel Tower. But we see Bubo limping Are you okay? yeah. as he yeah. makes his way towards Meow yeah. here. Alan and uh, the police department along with Vince appear. Yes, his striker did get destroyed because, uh, you know, shockwaves tend to destroy electric things. It uh, shockers, shocks, <laughs> are basically EMPs. So uh, exactly, what's left of them? And then at this point, it was gone. The sentinels were pretty much four guys, and one of them didn't really want to be there. I'm talking about Vector. So it's a dire situation. And you can see there, uh, Leon was working with Dr. Animal on this electrical thing. Molten Man and Shocker are just talking because they are just talking, they are trying to pass some time. We also have um, Mysterio and Mysterio just getting closer, bonding. As Mysterio uh, it's, is, in a moment, he's going to accept to mentor Anchor. That is pretty much how I would explain magic in the Toyland universe. It's the power of manifestation, in a way. If you think of something hard enough and you channel your energy into it, it will appear, it will happen, it will... Well, depends on what you think. Say, if I want an apple right now in my hand, I just have to really wish, really want that apple to be in my hand. And with enough energy from my body, from my own body, um, I don't really have many words to explain it, but if I really want that apple, I, it will appear in my hand. That's how I would explain, in a way, the magic in this universe. It doesn't really make much sense now that I say it. Mysterious name will last for a future generation, yet uh, neither the age, uh, the ages of Mysterio nor Anchor are known. So who knows, they might be the same age, no generation to follow up. Uh, Dr. Anime is just there like, Yep, whatever you say, just don't blow me up. That's Vince's car. Don't you think of course, Bubo and Meowth in the back, because uh, they are going back to the headquarters. Their mission is basically done here. Bubo gets angry. He just wants to stop Leon. He doesn't care about orders. And this, uh, once again, I get to animate a car crash, which I do enjoy. Um, yeah, in case you haven't noticed, Bubo is wearing Jordans this season. Only this season. Why did I make him wear Jordans? I don't know. Might be because I, when I made this figure, I had recently watched Across the Spider Verse, and you know, Miles wears Jordans as well. They are a, a, quite a beautiful pair of shoes, and I don't think they come in this color or this color combo. So maybe they could be the Shantai specials. Hit me up, Nike. And now Harley comes in and saves the situation with our bat. She stops a Mustang, and yes, the engine sound I tried to make as close to a Mustang because I, for some reason I couldn't find a rolling engine sound for this specific model. Maybe because everyone is just doing cold starts and burnouts. Yeah. Yet the car interior is the same as the Alfa Romeo because I couldn't be bothered and, and I also ran out of foam to make a new one. Yes, we don't really know the plan. The plan is never actually revealed. Uh, and um, there is an actual reason why, uh, I, I will tell you, yeah, it's because I couldn't think of a plan. So it's a good thing that it didn't get put into action. Hey. So yeah, as I said, the tone of this season is a lot more uh, fun, a lot lighter. And <laughs> watching this episode right after Sentinels 2, there is a huge tone of difference there. They are, they are two completely different movies in terms of tone. We see Mysterio and Mysterio 
conjure uh, two illusions. Um, Anchor conjures a humongous orb to keep him in line with uh, what he did in the Guardians, where he was also conjuring Pantene aliens. And Mysterio summons a dragon, which is also a thing he did in Spectacular Spider-Man. Well, it wasn't actually a dragon, it was more of a flying snake. I think that counts as a dragon, though. But yeah, here it's a full, full bone dragon attacking Harley. And Harley, because she's Harley, she just takes on the dragon, but gets punched by Himagazor. This time Molten Man can have some fun, because it's not a forest, and he scares Mouth away with a fireball. And here Vince comes in to help. He finishes off Shocker. Harley may or may not have a crush on Vince. I'm never going to um, explain that more than it's shown in this season or that I am doing right now. You are not getting that information out of me. And yeah, Anchor just gives up. He's done, he doesn't want to get it. And yes, wait, let me catch it. Yes, I hope that if uh, Nike does make Google's Jordans, the Shantai specials, the sole is fireproof because you just gotta be accurate to the source material. You do never know, I mean, who knows when you're going to have to fight Molten Man where you're just out in town with your friends and your fancy shoes. Now, this ending with Bubble not killing Leon um, does kind of set up Leon returning in the future as a recurring villain for Bubble and Bubble centric stories. I have not yet decided if that's going to happen. I mean, I only have one or two things planned after Toyland War on Earth. Uh, that's going to be a big shake-up. Pretty much uh, as big as the shake-up that Marvel had after Endgame. But uh, hopefully not as disappoint disappointing. And this is where Bubo adopts a no-kill rule. Yes, uh, Bubo did see that Vector didn't die, but uh, then Vector also disappeared in his point of view uh, after Shantai Season 2 because he went to Gotham. So, for all Bubba knows, Vector has gone again. Because yes, Vector is in New City. Uh, he helped the Sentinels as you just saw. Yeah, Jade is voiced by AI. I'm just going to skip over that. She sounds very British. Um, I don't know if I like it. Uh, actually, I don't really. But uh, it certainly sounds more feminine than whatever I tried to do in Season 2. And this is the final courtroom scene uh, with Matt Murdock. You can see there in the background, Vector was attending because he did testify. So that was Shantai Season 3, the final season of Shantai, and I think I wrapped up a good story and good character development for Bubo there, starting from season 1 to season 3. I think he grew a lot and he became, uh, became quite an interesting character. But I also am biased because, you know, he's special to me. We only have two things to look at uh, left in this phase. Triro and the Teenage Mutant short. I'm going to start with the short since, you know, it doesn't really, it's not really a big thing. So this was a short made in a few hours, like the whole thing. I didn't, I didn't even write it. It was all improvisation on the spot. This was made to test the camera, and it was made with the help of two of my friends from the uni dorms. The frame rate is much smoother here. Don't ask me why or how it happened. And yeah. Uh, you can tell this is a different universe just by comparing this to Shantai, because Vince here is a villain. Whereas uh, in Shantai he is a man of the law, a man of the state. However, he is called the same, he is Vincent the Rat. All the voices in this short are AI because I just wanted something there. Uh, I didn't want to hire voice actors for a one minute short. Um, and I didn't all, I also didn't want to do voices for these characters, so um, I hope you can excuse me for that. Oh. Yeah, all the weapons were made by me. I bought all these for uh, actually five because the turtles and Vincent I bought in the same flea market, and none of them came with weapons, so I had to make them. 
And that's the last of Vincent. Uh, his belly just got cut in half. Shiro was a show that I had in mind and I wanted to do ever since writing Bantalong Tech, so a long time ago. Um, I always wanted to have this prequel series of how Truro came to be from David Hall. And um, I think it's a good story. I think you can really see how David fell down and became Truro. Uh, I wouldn't call it an empathetic story or, or a sympathetic story because... I mean, he is a bad person, after all, uh, even from the start, you can say. But you can see why he is how he is, what events have uh, led to him being like that. This uh, show is probably the biggest, um, the biggest victim of AI, because there's a lot of AI voices in there. So I'm not going to explain every AI voice that comes, just the ones that I feel are actually important to the story. Matt Kellen is supposed to be the perfect guy, you know, the guy in school that just is good and everything and is popular and all. He's blonde. Everyone loves a blonde guy. And uh, yes, the Triro figure is the same head and hair as he was in Universe, but uh, with the body from my old, old, old video with the custom Benton play Playmobil toy, and funny enough, in the background you can see uh, Freddy Patrick and Happy uh, Rossum. Uh, first, they're here, they're not their respective characters, they're just background characters, but I don't really have that many Playmobil figures because I don't collect them. Uh, the only reason why I have more than two or three is because I needed Robotians for this show. That's Hayley Steinfeld before she was turned into Harley Quinn. Uh, this is also a background that I just drew, all coffee, and you also have a menu here, just like with the beer cage. Congrats. And we see that um, David did graduate cum laude, not summa cum laude, but still cum laude, so he is a good student, but he always felt overshadowed by Matt Callan, so there's a lot of jealousy there. And yet, those are exactly the type of bottles that coffee is served in. I won't have it. Of course, Katush um, comes back to voice his other original character, David Hall and Trio. I He j does a good job because it's his character. It's expected, of, uh, honestly. Another thing in the in this particular scene, if you look at the, the shots of David's face, uh, you can notice the, the bottle moving from right in front of his face more to the right side of the table or his left side. I put that in as symbolism, but I also forgot what exactly it symbolizes because I don't know if it uh, symbolizes some political party because I don't, I, I'm not involved with politics, I don't understand them, I, I try not to think about them too much. So yeah, that is up for your interpretation. And five years later, maybe it goes from coffee to alcohol which is uh, sadly another thing that I can relate to. Yeah, it David has been really affected by uh, Matt Helen overshadowing him, and this is the final nail in the coffin, because Matt Helen becomes the President of the United States. And this is like 40 years before Matt and Omnitech, which came out in 2021, so this would make it in the... 80s so yeah i don't know who was the president in the us in like the early 80s but um that doesn't matter anymore. it's matt kellen i've rewritten history you can see that his room is a mess this honestly uh deserves a spot in the neckbeard nests subreddit uh and i didn't mention the tv announcer in the bar scene and also the TV announcer here uh, is also Gareth Thompson, the guy who voices uh, Iron Man. Uh, this was actually him who wanted to come and help. I didn't uh, go out and ask him to. So uh, yeah, thanks. I just thanks to him. Also, don't call that number. I used the random phone number generator. I don't know who that belongs to. 
if it belongs to anyone, don't call it, please. And that is the Trigger theme song. Uh, the I had in mind, with like a year before I began writing this, I knew that the main musical theme of the show, I wanted it to be inspired by funk. You know, that techno music, funk. The actual Trigger theme is not quite funk, it's a bit more grand, more, uh, I would say more orchestra, but it's not really an orchestra, but it's a good theme for him, I enjoy it. So here he is training. Um, due to this being a Playmobil figure, I was really limited in the actions I could do with him, because his legs are uh, only articulated at the abs, or kind of. No knees, no ankles, no nothing, so yeah, it was hard. But he's training and here he meets the lawyer who is just the beast figure from KFC and he joins the space mission and this is where it all goes wrong. These are actually, this time, Freddy Patrick and Ralph Rossum, who is called Happy because he's always happy. You can tell during the series that uh, he's not really... Uh, the most uh, serious of people. He's kind of childish. Uh, Ralph here is played by an AI of Tobey Maguire, this time without the voice modifier like I use on Fins. Yeah, the space mission was supposed to go to Mars, which uh, pretty much proves that Robotia is in the Milky Way. And this is them jo uh, boarding the spaceship. And if you listen closely in the background, I've turned the volume down here, but you can go back to the episode and uh, check it out. It is actually a funk song from uh, Space Odyssey. Yes, the ship is basically just the box from some perfume. And the space spaceship is just a light bulb. And the space that you see in the background is a TV. You can see smoke there. And this is where it goes wrong. This is why you don't... Uh, sign into space programs that you see on TV at midnight. Not that it usually happens, but who knows. And he crash lands into Robotia. And this is the first contact with the Robotian species as um, this Robotian finds them. And that is actually the uh, harshest word used in a Toyland project, and this is the last time it probably would be used, unless I make a Deadpool movie. Um, I wanted the truer series to be a bit more edgy, which is why I actually show the consumption of alcohol. Um, and I have David Swear right there. I wanted this to be a bit more mature. This is also not, um, not necessary to watch for the main Toyland story. Uh, you can leave this out. It's it's uh, additional info, so it's cool, um, but it's not necessary, which is why I'm also leaving it at the end of this video. In episode 2, the trio are now stuck on Robotia, and they have to try to adapt to how that works. You can hear them talking in a weird language that's supposed to be Robotian. It's actually English, but I took the letters from the words and scrambled them around and tried to talk, like, tried to read them. And that's best special effects 2023, right there. And uh, here we have some info. Uh, this is actually a Playmobil skeleton figure, I think, from what I searched. You can see height is 3 inches, uh, which is also how Tepig referred to Peter in Sentinels 1 as being 6 inches. Uh, so that's a hint that these are still just toys. They're not real uh, people. Weight 70 kilograms though. So that's quite some density to have 70 kilos in 3 inches. Age unknown, species unknown, planet unknown, because the Robotians don't know of the existence of Earth. And we know that they live for a lot more years than we do, because they're robots. So age is unknown. They don't know the human age characteristics. I did want to present the Robotian as being a superior uh, civilization to us in terms of technology, uh, which is why this translator exists and all all the fancy stuff. Of course, David being the more uh, the more down to earth one, 
um, is the one to actually give the info to Robotians because if they were to take after uh, Ralph, it would not be good. And here they meet Logius. No, not Logius. I'm so stupid. Cybel. Cybel, who has been one of my favorite characters to write on this particular show. Uh, and it also, it kind of even felt sad for me to kill him. But it had to be done for the story. Cybel was supposed to have a male voice, but no. The limitations of AI. Yes, Robotians do not drink alcohol because they're Robotians. We later find out uh, it's a microchip mix, which could you could interpret as an allegory to drugs, whatever. However, they do have night clouds. And that's their hotel room. And of course, it seems expensive to them because everything in Robotia is at higher standards than it is on Earth. And yes, Robotians do not like being called robots. Of course, Freddy Fink, being the serious one of the group, he wants to get out. He does not enjoy this planet. And David, at first, is on board with him. But we all know that changes. That is actually the second funk song, the song that I use in this uh, series. It's uh, Incoming by McCorson. Or, no, it's MC Orson. I'm pretty sure. I did get a corporate, like, not a corporate strike. Strike. It was a like a hey, you know, use this. But luckily, he does let people use his music. So, cheers, Orson. This is the Robotian Club scene. Another scene that I had in mind back when I was visualizing this series. So I was glad I got to do it. And I'm not going to like that club looks banging. I'm not a big club guy. I don't really like going to clubs. But this looks amazing. I would I would completely vibe there. If you are wondering how these three humans were able to consume the microchip mix, I, I don't know. I haven't consumed any microchip mix. So ask them. Don't ask, ask me. And there uh, we see three, uh, David starting to get a little curious, starting to want to know more about the Robotian way of life. Now into alien, into... Uh, into episode 3, Space Heist. Uh, this is the first series to have episode names, by the way. Uh, three of uh, David. He's not three or yet. David finally meets Logius, the, the leader of the country, not the president, the leader of the entire planet, and starts to think that maybe he does not want to leave this. And yes, Logius is just icebreaker retold. Because... Uh, in at the end of I actually can't remember I watched I rewatched the movies yesterday and I can't remember in which post credit scene but Icebreaker gets teleported to somewhere by Kangoo. Um apparently back in the past in a robot's body. But yeah this is Icebreaker retooled uh, to be the leader of the Robotians. And yes, David does stutter there. You might think that's because Katush is doing a bad job. You know, David would be a bit, uh, a bit emotional, a bit, uh, you know, dumbstruck by meeting this. It's still a new experience for him to be on another planet, and he's now got a mission. He now knows his goal. This is, this is the neuron activation moment in his head. Yes, it uh, sun isn't really a thing here. It does affect things, but because this is a robotian plant. There's not much much vegetation, the sun doesn't really come through, maybe because of the pollution. There's a lot of thinking to be done about this planet. David is distracted because of the conversation he's just had. Those are the ships. It's actually just one ship. Can can you guess which one it is? It's this one in the middle because these have the weird uh, painted shadow. What is a kilometer? That is also a thing that I wanted to include in this as soon as I envisioned the character of Ralph, Ralph Rosen being the stupid guy of the group. You know, the what is a kilometer, the America meme. I just realized that in this shot, it looks as if David and Ralph are holding hands. And here comes the trio theme song again. I really like it, if you're gonna tell. 
Ralph has such a simple soul. And this is where David gets uh, another brain activation moment. And he starts murdering people, as you do. That's his transformator thing. Um, you know, in uh, Onitech, that he could create weapons and things. Just like Proto Ratchet could. This is basically the prototype version of that. That he gets later when he gets the full armor. Yes, David thinks this thinks this is his destiny. To become the leader of a planet to overshadow uh, Matt Kellen, who is the president of a country. That's pretty much his thinking here. He has to do one better every time. And Ralph is the first one to be killed by David's destiny. I mean, he had to, you know. There's not really much more I could do with him. And then he kills Freddy as well. And because of all the chaos, he gets arrested even though he tries to justify it and uh, try to seem like the good guy here. But no, he's a homo sapiens on a Robotian planet. He's going to be discriminated. Robotians are not as perfect as David uh, sees them. Episode 4, and this is the episode where David uh, is in prison and has to adapt to life there. Uh, this is also uh, him continuing on his path to become Triro. The prison announcer is Gareth Thompson. Once again, thank you, Gareth, for uh, everything that you did. You've been a huge help to me. Yes, this is a very, very happy... Uh, about his work, Robot. You can just tell it in his voice. He just is having the time of his life. Yet here, David finds out that Robotians do not know do not know what bribes are, which of course is a big thing on Earth. Uh, and he, that's another thing that pushes him to think that Robotians are perfect, or in his own words, perfect in every domain. And this is the debut of Fanalt who is the guy that uh, helps Triro and uh, kind of supports him into becoming who he ends up becoming. And here we see David for the first time in the Triro armor without a helmet, because he's still transitioning. Did I just make David a transsexual? Oh, who cares? Uh, it's good to have the representation. Um, the exact same figure, like or figure from Benton Omnitech. Well, without the cape, because uh, he's not uh, Emperor yet. And this is the debut of Triro showing his powers. Yes, Fenalt is the one to give Triro his name. Triro means resurgence in Robotian. He just rips apart the Robotian. That's how strong he is. And this is basically uh, 30 years later. Uh, Triro has been in prison. And this is when he gets out and announces the challenge to Logius. And this is building up suspense to the finale where Triro faces Logius. This little guy certainly looks like a uh, Cybal. It's the same figure but repainted. He's not Cybal. These two scenes show the both of them preparing for their fight. Basically the, the first leader's challenge in 30 years that uh, David has been here, and 50 that Logis has been leading. The first leader's challenge in Robotia in 80 years. And this is the arena, this, are, this is the crowd, every Robotian figure that I have. Of course, I'm going to have more, but these are the ones I have right now. Logis, uh, equipped with his battle axe that uh, we always saw on his uh, little table. And of course, he's fighting his uh, royal cape, which is basically a piece of paper. But it uh, it enlarges, enlarge is that a word? In biggest, it 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 uh, makes his shoulders look larger, so makes him more intimidating. And yes, Triro is using the transformator device, transformator device, while Logis is using his traditional, his more traditional weapon. Of course, Logis is uh, racist against uh, Homo sapiens. Why not? Logis also has a transformator device, which is how he creates a sword, because he's the leader, of course, he would have the latest technology. So they have a full-on lightsaber fight here, 
which was a pain in the ass to animate, uh, to edit, because I had to overlay every single frame here, and that was tedious. Yet, however, Trezor wins in the end, stabbing Logius, and now he declares his leadership and cuts Logius' head off in a very triumphant moment for Trezor. Victor and Trezor is, of course, the same thing that uh, he chanted in Bentenom Direct when he did his uh, speech while running for president. The crowd is literally just layers of me in different voices doing the Victor and Trezor. Somehow it works. This show also doesn't have a post credit scene because uh, why would it? And honestly it doesn't need one. As I said this is a separate story that is not uh, required. But uh, this has been the second phase of the Toyland cinematic universe. Pretty much it's only missing one movie but as I said that's going to get its own uh, behind the scenes video. And I certainly hope you all will enjoy it and that you have enjoyed this phase. I mean, certainly from my point of view, it seems that you have enjoyed it. Uh, it's been a period of huge growth for the channel and I thank you all for that.